Howdy, friends. Thank you for joining me as we look back on some of the best moments from The Proof Podcast in 2023. The Proof team and I wish you a happy new year, and we're grateful for your ongoing support of our work. As a special thank you, my team and I have created the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, which begins on February 1st. It's a zero-cost, 12-week challenge to build science-backed health habits to optimize your physical and mental well-being, reduce your risk of chronic disease, and help you live longer. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof for more details and to download your copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge. Last week on the podcast, we featured part one of the Proof 2023 Year in Review. This week, we'll dive into part two, a compilation of topics mostly focused on the science of aging, zone two training, the impact of food systems on our environment, and how we can change our habits for better health. I'm excited to share clips from my conversations with a range of guests from across the year, including Dr. Inigo San Milan, Charles Brenner, George Mombio, and Judson Brewer. I hope you enjoy this episode and you can use the information within to enhance your journey to live better for longer. Please enjoy. I'm hoping that to to start here you can kind of help me out. I'm I'm struggling to define aging. Hmm. And some say aging is itself uh, a disease. I'm not sure where you kind of stand on this and then others say well, it can't be a disease because it occurs from birth or, or maybe even from conception. And uh, at this time of, uh, of life, function appears to be improving, not declining. As someone that studies the biology of aging, how do you define it? Yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, it's a great, great question. I wish I had a really simple answer for you. So first I'll tackle this, is aging a disease question? Um, because I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, it, it leads to a lot of, uh, disagreement and angst and, and I don't really, I, I think it's really a semantic argument. I, I don't think it really matters whether we define aging as a disease and in, in the big, big picture. I think what's more important to appreciate is that biological aging is the root cause of most of the major diseases, causes of death and disability in developed countries. And regardless of whether we define biological aging as a disease, that underlying relationship between biological aging and all of the major causes of death and disability is really what's important. Because what that means is that if we can understand and eventually modify biological aging, we can have an impact on all of these different functional declines and diseases that, that go along with old age. Um, now, the definition of aging, again, is gets back, get, gets, gets complicated very quickly. I think the, the first thing I would say is, you know, I've already started by defining it as biological aging. And I try to actually use that phrase because I think it's important to be precise. That's the only way we can communicate and understand each other is if we're precise in the words that we use. And aging by itself means different things to different people. Some people think of chronological aging, just the passage of time. That's mm -hmm. a legitimate definition. Given what I've been doing for the last 20 plus years, which is studying the biology of aging, I naturally think about the biology of aging when I say aging. So that's what I mean. And, and all I really mean by that are the cellular, molecular, tissue, organ level changes that happen as, a, as an organism goes from being young to old and the mechanisms that underlie those changes. <clears throat> I think um, you alluded to this idea that, you know, aging actually starts during development. I think to some extent that's true. The same processes that are active during development continue to be active post-developmentally and probably contribute to the functional declines that go along with aging. So they are a part of the biology of aging. So I'm sorry, I wish I, I wish I had a 30 second answer for you, but I think this is this is a, a complicated topic and, and it, it doesn't lend itself to simple answers. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned there getting to the kind of the root cause. I think people, when they think about the common diseases that that are responsible for premature death today, probably cardiovascular disease and cancer comes to to mind top of the list there are other mm -hmm. things of course but let's take athero atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as an example here is 
the aging, the cellular processes that you're talking about, are they preceding the the sort of fatty plaque that's building up in the artery? Are they are they upstream of that? And then the disease, as we know it, that ends up killing someone is a kind of manifestation of the aging process. Is that how you see it? Uh, I, I think that's fair. I, I think you know, um, upstream is. Uh, is, is probably the, the right term. The way I would think about it is, so it probably depends on the specific disease. So you mentioned cancer, which is a whole, uh, cancer is sort of its own unique beast that we can kind of dive into, but cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, kidney disease, metabolic dysfunction, immune senescence, which leads to increased risk of infection, right? All of these have age as their greatest risk factor. And in fact, it's not a linear relationship. What I mean by that is that your, your, increase in risk of developing these diseases doesn't go up the same amount each year. It actually goes up exponentially as you get older. So we can have a discussion around whether aging, biological aging is mechanistically causal for the disease, which is kind of where you were immediately going. Are the molecular mechanisms that I, that I associate with biological aging actually causing the plaques, right, that go along mm -hmm. with cardiovascular disease? That's going to depend a little bit on the disease. And, and I think those are important discussions to, to have and to understand. I would say first principle, though, is that just this simple relationship between age and risk of developing all of these different diseases shows us that, that the biology of aging is, at a minimum, creating a physiological state that places you everyone at increased risk of developing these diseases. And then the mechanistic links between aging biology and disease processes are going to be somewhat different for, for different diseases. So for cardiovascular disease, again, it's not only one cell type, one tissue type at play here. So there are going to be functional changes within the heart itself that are driven by the biology of aging. So things like mitochondrial dysfunction that we know contribute to declines in heart function, which lead to decreases in circulatory capacity with age. And then there are sort of systemic effects that are not unique to the heart, such as inflammatory signals given off by senescent cells, another what we call hallmark of aging, that contribute to vascular dysfunction uh, and, and dysfunction in other tissues and organs. So again, I'm going to keep saying this. There's not a simple 30 second answer to any of these things, but I think the answer is probably both, right? Aging is causally contributing to mechanisms specific to each individual disease. And it's, there are these systemic changes that go along with aging that maybe are indirectly influencing risk of developing these diseases. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to hallmarks of aging and and biological age and we can maybe discuss sort of the epigenetic clocks that that are sure. out there and people are talking about um but before that there's this this idea and i think this kind of is a continuation of what you're talking about here the relationship between aging and these i guess age-related diseases maybe we would call them there's this idea out there that you can get to maybe 80 or 90 Maybe this is what we all aspire to, um, and you just die in your sleep without having endured a, a kind of overt disease state, you know, dying of old age, so to speak. That seems to be a goal. Many people will, would say, look, I'd like to just get to 80 or 90 in good health and then just uh, pass away peacefully. Is that possible that the, the body can kind of just shut down because the cells are, are generally aged versus some sort of more overt disease like a brain tumor or a lung cancer or a heart attack, et cetera. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, clearly it's possible because some people do achieve something close to that. Right. But uh, uh, even then I think uh, I'm, uh, I would speculate that, that there are, I mean, even in those people, right, there are going to be sub disease, subclinical functional declines. And, and so this is actually, I think an important point is sometimes in these discussions, we focus way too much maybe on, diseases, right? Which are clinically diagnosed conditions based on symptoms, right? But even in people who are non-diseased or that you're still going to see functional declines that go along with aging, there has yet to be an 85-year-old that has walked this earth that has been functionally 
the same as they were at 25, even if they don't have a disease. So, so I don't think it's, I think it's probably unrealistic to think that even in that kind of, you know, best case scenario that you aren't going to still have some functional declines preceding any disease diagnosis. Having said that, it is absolutely possible to push those functional declines back, minimize those functional declines, push the diseases of aging back later into life and maintain quality health, you know, as long as possible. And and for me personally, and I think for many people in the field, that really is as much or more the goal than it is to significantly increase human lifespan. It's it's really you know, about this concept of health span, maximizing the healthy periods of life, maintaining function. I really personally, I focus a lot on function, you know, as much as I do disease, because I think that's really what's important to most of us, right? We want to be able to do the stuff that we want to do as long as possible, maximize our ability to enjoy life. And that's really, you know, a lot about how well are you able to function. So I think that's, it's important just to keep that, that in mind and not get carried away by worrying about only diseases. Um, so again, I don't think it's likely that you can be in perfect health until you're 95 and then, you know, not wake up the next morning, but it absolutely is the case that we can, we can maintain a good quality of life very, very late into life. Um, uh, and, and maximize those, the, those years of health. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the goal being to sort of optimize function and to, I guess, uh, compress the years of disease that were uh, that are affecting our function. So we're right. we're enjoying a longer health span. How does this relate to the hallmarks of aging? So if you're at dinner and and someone says, "Okay, Matt, I'm on I'm on board this idea of optimizing my function." Um, what should I know about the hallmarks of of aging? Why are they important for us to kind of uh, piece this together and then set up a lifestyle um, and or other interventions that give us the greatest chance of enjoying uh, the lo the longest health span possible. Yeah. So, so I would say, first of all, before we dive into the hallmarks themselves, probably the most important thing is just to appreciate that, that there really is this biology of aging, right? That there are uh, biological processes that determine the rate at which different animals age and within the same species within humans, the rate at which individual people age. So there is this, these, this biological process that we can study and understand very much like development as a process. Um, and in principle, when we understand it well enough, we can modify that biology in a way that will delay the functional declines and diseases that go along with aging. And in fact, we've been extremely successful. We as a field now have been extremely successful at doing this in laboratory animals. There are multiple interventions that have been shown to significantly delay the biology of aging, target the hallmarks of aging, increase lifespan and extend health span in every laboratory organism where this has been attempted and probably most relevant to people in mammals like mice and rats, we can increase lifespan 20, 30, all the way up to 50% by targeting the biology of aging. So independent of what that biology is at the molecular level, just understanding that is, I think, probably the most important thing. Now, I think the other thing to, under, to, to appreciate is, again, as a field, we've been pretty successful at starting to understand what that biology is. And that's where the hallmarks come in because now we can start to give names to these highly evolutionarily conserved processes that seem to play a fundamental role in modulating the rate at which different animals age or, or different individuals within a species age. And so depending on who you talk to and depending on the day of the week, there's nine or 10 or maybe 11 of these hallmarks of aging and they're overlapping and interacting. So it's a little bit messy, but, um, but we can give names to these things. And they include things like telomere shortening, which lots of people have heard of. We've known about telomere shortening as a potential contributor to aging for more than 20 years now. They include mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are, uh, of course, um, sort of colloquially referred to as the powerhouses of the cell. They produce a lot of the molecular energy that, that our cells need in order to function. 
mitochondrial damage is a hallmark of aging. So decreased power output is one way to think of it. Um, senescent cells we can probably talk about is another uh, hallmark of aging. And so there, there are nine of these things. Epigenetic changes is the one that probably is getting the most attention um, right now. Uh, DNA damage. So these are all cellular, molecular processes that that scientists in the field, um, there's some consensus around the idea that these contribute directly to the biology of aging and thereby to the functional declines and diseases that go along with old age. I believe some of the supplements that he had included in that in that protocol are considered or perhaps marketed as senolytics, and these are various sort of polyphenols. Um, so perhaps we can zoom in a little bit on, on that. This class of um, therapeutics called senolytics um, seems to be, um, you know, there's a lot of buzz around it at the moment. So what are senolytics and, and why are they something that the aging field is excited by? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to zoom absolutely right out to give you an answer for this one. I know that you and Matt talked about this idea of the hallmarks of the aging process. And these are something I talk about in my book. I've got 10. There are, you know, people will give you different numbers. And there's actually been a new paper just released, which would bring the total to 12. Um, I think some of those are incorporated in some of mine, but you know, it depends on the day of the week, exactly what's included. But what, what are these hallmarks fundamentally? They are changes that happen inside our biology, inside the biology of other animals. And first of all, they're things that change with age. Obviously, something can't be, you know, causing the aging process if it doesn't change with age and they're things that if we in the lab increase the rate of that change we can increase the rate of aging we can you know reduce lifespan we can increase disease and if we decrease that range of change sorry rate of change it seems to slow down what we broadly define as the aging process and that's how something gets classified as a hallmark so they're sort of potential causes of aging because they change with age and because changing them changes aging it seems as though they could be causal we don't know yet because we don't know exactly how these things all link together but that's the idea and there are a variety of these different hallmarks. They start at the very, very sort of tiny level, the molecules, things like uh, changes in our DNA. So we can get DNA damage, we can get mutations happening at the very smallest level inside cells. And then as we sort of magnify up, we can go all the way up to changes in whole systems in our body. So things like the immune system, dysfunction of the immune system. So we get less good at fighting disease. Our immune system gets less good at rooting out cancer cells and so on and so on. And that you know, gets worse and worse as we age as well. And in between these two scales, slap in the middle of the hallmarks, I put them, uh, the accumulation of what are called senescent cells. And these are cells that were actually first discovered way back in the 1960s by a guy called Leonard Hayflick. And he was watching uh, cells called fibroblasts that are just dividing in a dish. And he noticed that if he let them divide and divide and divide, then after about 50 cell divisions, something very strange happened. So the first thing is that the cells just stop dividing. But the second thing is, and I am by no means a cell biologist, by no means a microscopist, but you can see that there is something wrong with these cells. He called it the fried egg phenotype because these cells go from these sort of lovely, sort of ordered looking roundish objects to this splat. <laughs> They've got this really weird exterior shape. You can just see there's something very, very strange going on with these cells. And so they stopped dividing and entered this strange state. Um, he called it cellular senescence. We've already met that word senescence because it's just the biological uh, term for old. So he thought these cells were just becoming old, and that's you know something that's going on certainly in cells in a dish. The question is, does accumulation of these cells in actual living, uh, you know, mice in actual living people drive the aging process itself? And it took us a very long time to get to the point where we could answer that question, but I think it was convincingly starting to be answered in the 2000s. We noticed that these cells do indeed accumulate in um, in humans, in mice, and so on. And there are a variety of different reasons a cell can become senescent. So the crucial thing about this senescent state is it's non-dividing. And so the first reason that a cell can become senescent is that it gets a lot of damage or mutations in its DNA. Now, what are mutations? They're mistakes in the genetic code, essentially. And if a cell accumulates the wrong combination of mutations, that's how cancer starts. So if a cell's got this combination of mutations it can learn to divide and divide and divide indefinitely and that becomes a tumor and that can obviously go on to kill you so our bodies have got a number of mechanisms to try and stop that from happening and one of them is cellular senescence so if there's a load of damage to the dna the cells looking a bit fishy then the body just slams on the brakes puts it into this senescent state you can also get cells that are senescent because um, they've divided too many times. We've already talked about that because of uh, the, the Leonard Hayflick's experiments. That happens in our bodies too. And finally, you can just get cells that are stressed. They're in a sort of stressful environment. I don't mean stressed in sort of the you know day-to-day, -day, my job stressful sense. I mean that in the molecular biology sense of stress. So there's stressful chemicals essentially going on you know in, inside the body. 
So cells can enter this senescent state for a variety of reasons. And when we're young, this is happening all the time. You know, you and me have got plenty of senescent cells in us right now as we have this conversation. But because we are relatively young, I guess, then what's going on is that these cells enter the senescent state and they start um, spitting out this variety of, of, of different molecules. And what the molecules are doing is they're saying, hey, over here, I'm senescent. Um, you know, you might want to come and clear me up. And the, the place that they're signaling, of course, is the immune system. So an immune cell will sense this chemical cocktail. It'll dash over to the senescent cell. It'll gobble it up. And that's just a way of getting rid of that senescent cell. And so once that senescent cell is gone, it's not a problem anymore. And that whole process can continue. So all the time in our bodies, as we're young, those senescent cells are being produced and the immune system is clearing them up. But the problem is, as you get older, these processes, they, they change fundamentally. So um, you can start accumulating more of these cells. There are more cells with DNA damage. There are more cells with mutations. There are more cells that are in a stressful environment. There are more cells that are divided too many times because that's what they do during the course of their cellular lives. But also the immune system is getting less effective. I already mentioned that's another of the hallmarks of aging. And so it's getting less good at responding to these signals and less good at clearing up that, uh, you know, th those damaged cells. And what then happens is that this, this, uh, it's called the SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype, which is a hell of a mouthful. Senescence associated is associated with these cells. Secretory, they secrete them. So they sort of give out these chemicals and phenotype is just biological word for thing that happens. <laughs> so biologists do like to give things uh, sometimes slightly overcomplicated names, but this SASP, it's essentially the, Hey, over here, come and clear me up immune system, um, signal. But, Unfortunately, when these cells start to accumulate, they can that 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 can essentially become something that accelerates the whole aging process. It can drive this process called chronic inflammation, which is a sort of hyperactivity of the immune system that contributes to aging. It can make cells become cancerous, ironically, so something that started out as an anti-cancer mechanism can actually cause cancer in sufficient quantities. And finally, it can actually even induce senescence in surrounding cells. So it's got this sort of snowballing type effect that means that it can get worse and worse and worse at time and so this does seem to be a very obvious candidate for a cause of aging it's something that accumulates in our bodies as we get older it seems to drive a whole range of age-related diseases so that might be quite a depressing story but there's some really you know good exciting news at the end of this story and the reason we can be so sure um, that these things do cause age-related diseases is because scientists have come up with drugs that can remove these senescent cells while leaving the rest of the cells of the body intact and I think the most compelling evidence for this is a paper that came out in 2018. Scientists gave these drugs to mice that were, I think, 24 months old, so that's sort of 60, 70 years old in human years. And they found that they basically, I'm happy to say, made the mice biologically younger. So they obviously they removed the senescent cells. That's a good thing. Um, they find the mice live longer, but they're not just staggering along, you know, with their frailty extended somehow at the end of their lives. They get less cancer. They get less heart disease. They get fewer cataracts uh, clouding the lenses of their eyes. Um, they can run further and faster on the tiny mouse-sized treadmills they use in these experiments. Um, they seem to reverse some of the cognitive decline that comes with aging. So if you put a, a young mouse in a maze, it's often very excited to explore its new environment, find the food, whatever. But an older mouse might be a bit more anxious. Maybe it's just a bit less uh, physically active, and so it doesn't want to go and explore. But by uh, removing some of these senescent cells, you can rejuvenate some of that youthful curiosity. And finally, it's really worth, you know, if listeners haven't uh, seen a picture of these mice, again, I'm not a mouse biologist, I don't, I don't play with mice in the lab regularly, but nonetheless, you don't have to be an expert. You can see the mice that have had the drugs, they look fantastic. They've got much better fur, they've got thicker fur, they've got less grey fur, they've got plumper skin, they're, they're less fat than the mice that have um, not been given the drugs. So it seems to have really this absolutely almost global effect on the ageing process. And that's hugely exciting because I think this is the paradigm that we want to, you know, have going forward is finding a hallmark of aging, identifying a way to change that hallmark of aging back to a more youthful state, and then potentially preventing a whole range of different diseases. And so now we're at the stage where these things definitely work in mice. You've got really, really strong evidence that senolytics have an effect in mice. And so the next step is human trials. And we've already talked about this process in the sense that these senolytics aren't being trialed. You know, we aren't just giving them to 50-year-olds who've accumulated senescent cells throughout their lives and, you know, preventative uh, for an aging uh, indication. We're now using these drugs um, for people who've got very serious diseases. So there's a disease called called lung fibrosis, which is very common in older people. And senescent cells are often found hanging around the site of this uh, fibrotic, so effectively scarred lung tissue. And so the idea is that by giving people who've got this disease that doesn't really have any great treatments at the moment, um, this, this sort of ray of hope with the senolytics, hopefully we can prove that they work, we can see that the senescent cells get removed. And the thing I really hope is not only that obviously the drugs work, the people get better, but also that the side effects are relatively mild. Because what that means is if there's a good side effect profile, we can then say, okay, these drugs don't have many side effects. Let's try giving them to people with, I don't know, late stage heart disease. That's another thing we know that senescent cells are related to, but it's something we already have drugs for. You know, we already have diet. We already have a variety of ways we can help people who've already had a heart attack, for example. 
And then again, if it's safe in that population, we can spread it wider and wider still. So this is a super exciting thing because hopefully we'll know the answer to the more severe diseases within the next few years. And if we can carry on widening that net, it's probably not going to be, you know, more than 5, 10, 15 years before we can start thinking about using these things preventatively for aging. And when you say drugs, we're talking here about senolytics. And do these uh, senolytics or compounds, are these typically or are they always polyphenols like fisetin and um, quercetin or are these just uh, certain types of senolytics and it's a much broader sort of category? It's a really interesting field, actually. So the the way that the the reason quercetin comes up so much is because in this 2018 paper, actually, but also in a lot of other papers from that group, in the original paper where they identified the first senolytic drugs, um, the way that they worked this out was they got a whole bunch of things that they thought might have some effect on senescent cells. And then they just got a bunch of cells in a dish and dripped various combinations of these drugs onto the cells in the dish. And they found the drug that killed the senescent cells, but left the bystander cells relatively unaffected. And in the end, after having tried a whole load of not just individual drugs, but as I said, combinations, they found that the most effective combination for killing senescent cells was quercetin, which is a flavanol. It's found in various fruit and veg, but it's also uh, plus desatinib, which is a chemotherapy drug. And it's important to say this is at much, much lower doses than you'd normally use it in cancer. But they found that this combination somehow got in there and effectively convinced those senescent cells to kill themselves, convinced them to go back onto the sort of cell suicide pathway where we'd very much hope they should have stayed. Um, so I think some of the sort of hype around quercetin has come because it was found in that context. The real question that we don't know the answer to is at what dose and um, in what context. Does, does quercetin on its own at a particular dose have the same effect in humans that it plus desatinib had in mice? And I think that's a really big question. There are some other flavanols that are being investigated as well. Um, there are other actual drugs. But I think um, the sort of long term of, of this field is going to be finding much, much more powerful and specific senolytics. The the reason that desatinib and quercetin end up being used is they're effectively off-the-shelf compounds. So these you know, scientists were trying a bunch of stuff that they had access to in the lab. But hopefully now we understand that senescent cells are important and that senolysis does seem to have positive effects, then we're going to go out and find specific drugs designed to be senolytics rather than just some flavanols that seem to happen to have that effect. And so maybe, you know, that's an argument for eating certain kinds of fruit that have the quercetin in it. It could possibly be the case that quercetin supplements are useful. But I think the more exciting prospect is a little bit further into the future when we come up with drugs and other interventions that can kill the senescent cells. And it's worth saying these things might not even be drugs. They might not even be supplements. Um, there are some people who come up with a vaccine for senescent cells. So you effectively teach the immune system to go after these cells a bit more effectively in older age. There are also uh, there are peptides. There are just a variety of different compounds and approaches. You know, there are probably going to be gene therapies again to kill these senescent cells. So it's a really, really fast moving field. And I'd be very surprised if it turns out that these flavanols are, you know, even in the top 10 when, it, when, when the dust settles and we've got the best treatments. So is it worth taking any senolytic supplements now i know there's a there's a few brands that are kind of selling them at the moment or, or claiming that they have in, in ingredients that have sort of senolytic properties um is that kind of worth the cost at the moment or, or are we better off just eating a healthy diet i think we just don't know i think the, the way that i sometimes look at these things is you know you find some foods that have got quercetin in that you quite like anyway and trying to you know, maybe amp that up slightly in your diet it might not be a clinically relevant dose that's often the case with these things like we know about resveratrol if you eat grapes or drink wine you have to eat like you know a ton of grapes and drink a you know 25 gallons of wine a day in order to possibly get anywhere near something that might be a clinical dose um but i think that really we just haven't got the evidence of these things and it's frustrating what we need to see is these randomized controlled trials or at least some kind of trial in humans and one of the big challenges is that um we're not even very good at counting senescent cells yet we don't have a really firmly agreed upon definition some scientists say it's due to expression of certain genes some other scientists might use something that you know looks for a particular protein in the cells and so on and so on but there isn't even a firm agreement on what exactly constitutes a senescent cell which means if you want to do a shorter term trial where rather than looking at lifespan which obviously takes ages you instead look does this thing remove the senescent cells you're going to find you know a room full of scientists arguing about what exactly constitutes a senescent cell so i think luckily we're at a, we're in a place this is hugely exciting there are startups there's you know big money going into some of this stuff unless you're already you know very old and willing to take a risk on these things i just watch and wait because the evidence is going to be coming in very very soon eat, eat your apples in the meantime <laughs> damn right keeps the doctor away that's what i've heard quick one folks i get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests 
The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Why do we age through our reproductive window? So why, why is it our cells cannot maintain the same youthful function all the way up until the end of our reproductive window? Essentially, why is it, why are we well, seeing they, the aging through you're, that process? What you're, you're talking about is, you know, why can't we age better? And, you know, we, we can age as well as we can age, you know? So, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm 61. What I do is I try to stay active, right? I don't think that there's no tech, um, you know, that is available to me. There's no, you know, young blood infusions, you know, there's no evidence basis for that. I guess what there's, I'm getting at though is what's happening in the cell. Intrinsically. Intrinsically that would explain that, that age. It's loss of repair capacity largely. You know, I don't know that anyone can fully answer that question. That's actually a really hard question. But um, we have a gene set that puts us together, right? And we reach our maximal, you know, size by around 20, right? And, um, and you know, the, 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 pr the problem is that it's, it's, from an evolutionary point of view, as I say, I'm going to use the the term that someone th threw at me on Twitter of hotness, right? The um, evolution is is basically if you look at at birds, right? You know, bird bird watching is a is a very enjoyable thing where you have have males that have remarkable plumage, and you have females that um, evaluate that, and they're they're talking back and forth to each other in, in very interesting ways. And um, all of that is a very complicated um, set of um, selective processes in male and female brains that is evaluating the other, the, the part, the potential partners, reproductive capacity, gene set, ability to provide, et cetera, et cetera. And those things operate throughout the animal kingdom. And um, it seems to me that um, because, here, here's one way that, that, that I've explained it. Um, here here in, in North America we, America, we have foxes, right? Usually the foxes are born in the spring and they can reproduce by the time they're about, you know, six or nine months old, right? So a male, you know, less than one year old male and female fox are, are pretty foxy, right? They, they, are, they are capable. They're long out of mom's care. They're capable of getting their own food. They can, they can identify the opposite sex and they can reproduce. Right. And they're going to, if they reproduce at the age of eight months, they're going to pass on a gene set. Now, if they're clever enough and capable enough to go through um, five or six winters, then they will be able to reproduce five or six times. And so they will contribute five or six times more genetic information into the fox gene pool. But the fact of the matter is, if they don't have very good longevity and they simply are able to reach their reproductive capacity, they will be able to contribute their genes to the gene pool. So their longevity is not a directly selected trait. Their vision is a selected trait. Their sense of smell is a selected trait. Their size is a selected trait. Their coat color is a selected trait. Their, um, their brains and their ability to know where the owls are from hearing is a selected trait. 
So dumb foxes, you know, get eaten by a bigger animal the first time they leave mom, right? So there aren't a lot of really dumb foxes that can reproduce. There's not a lot of blind foxes that can reproduce. There's not a lot of foxes that don't have a sense of smell that can reproduce. But a fox that can't live three or four years can still reproduce one or two or maybe three times. So what you're saying here and you're sort of underscoring is that evolution is selecting for genes based on what can help us survive, reproduce, and then care for our young. And after that, our genes really don't so, care so about especially us. Especially survive, survive the period, the per time between our birth and getting to reproductive uh, maturation. And, so and then I once we're at, at reproductive maturation, we're in our prime. And then all animals have some type of decline. Some animals are really, really good agers like naked mole rats and humans that can maintain for, 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 for a while. But a lot of animals aren't. What are the implications of, of this? What you're saying, there's no um, selection for longevity. There's no monogenic you know, longevity genes. This is polygenic. Uh, what are the implications with regards to targeting longevity when you start to think about it through this lens? It's a hard problem. Um, I, we know that... Um, you, we know that, first of all, we know that age is a risk factor for all sorts of diseases, most diseases, right? Um, but that doesn't make aging a disease, right? Aging, from my point of view, is a fact of life. We know that you can age better or worse and that it's very easy to age worse, right? So um, people that smoke, overeat, are sedentary, drink a lot of alcohol, um, engage in violent or dangerous activities, have occupational hazards, um, live shorter lives, right? Um, can you extend lifespan? I don't know that you can extend lifespan beyond a genetically encoded maximum, but you can, tr you can try to age better what's the genetically encoded maximum maximum we think it's humans? 120 we think it's 120 years um there's not really very good examples of any documented people to live beyond 122 so it, it looks like that's potentially the maximum do you think that perspective of what you've just shared there gets less airtime because it's a little less sexy and it's, I guess, could be perceived as a bit more cynical than the other kind of um, narrative being that we could extend lifespan, lifespan by a considerable amount. Well, you know, I, I'm all for healthy aging and um, more people living into their 90s and 100 and, and, and a little beyond that with vigor. So that I think that's a that's a good goal, um, but um, yeah, I don't see any tech on the horizon that would really extend beyond uh, genetically encoded uh, longevity uh, maxima. Um, you know, even caloric restriction is actually more problematic than people think it is because in the experimental environment, the control group is ad libitum fed. So basically overfed. So, you know, in, the, in, in nature, um, mice would be scurrying around all night collecting enough calories for them to live 24 hours, right? In a cage, they're provided with a big pile of food every day and they never run out of food. And so the ad libitum, the ad lib fed control mice um, are actually gaining weight 
and probably have a shortened lifespan with respect to, you know, uh, calorie restricted. Calorie res restricted is more like a normal mouse, right? So, so the, the way the results are reported, they will say caloric restriction, extended lifespan of, of these mice. Relative. But I would, yeah, but I would say, yeah, compared to the control group, I would say the control group of ad libitum fed mice and virtually all of the data that we have on mice had a shortened lifespan because we kept them confined in the cage and we fed them every day. Now, you can, you know, you can say, well, okay, but that's a good model for, you know, human that, you know, we're uh, ad libitum fed essentially, and we're less active than we used to be a, a thousand years ago. That's also true. But, um, you know, I don't see any um, drugs uh, that are being considered for lifespan extension as probable lifespan extension drugs. I see metformin as a drug for people with type 2 diabetes um, with evidence that it would probably um, blunt the beneficial effects of exercise. Rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor. Um, mTOR is a regulator of skeletal muscle function. And, um, you know, maintenance of our skeletal muscle is one of the most important things as we age because our skeletal muscle disposes of glucose and it keeps us uh, together so that we don't fall, you know, in, in, as we age. I would, I would be more likely to take a leucine analog to support my mTOR signaling than rapamycin or a rapamycin analog to inhibit my mTOR signaling. I'm not signing up for any rapamycin tests. That's interesting because it's rapamycin is, I guess, one of the front runners in the, the kind of longevity conversation right now. Right. So again, in, in, in mouse models, you see that extends lifespan. It may be extending frailty, uh, however, um, especially in, in the human context. So it comes back to that trade-off. Right. Let's step through this. Um, as intensity is increasing, so the listener can appreciate what changes are happening with regards to the substrates that are being used to produce energy, where that energy is being produced. And Inigo, it may, it may make sense here to start introducing zones. I think people have heard you know, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five. So if you think it's a good idea, perhaps as we're talking about the changes that are occurring with regards to how energy is being produced and where it's being produced, we can kind of pair that with the zone slash intensity. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, again, the way I see zones is from, uh, you know, like a cellular uh, metabolism glasses, right? Um, uh, what, so I see, for example, is this also based on the muscle fiber recruitment pattern, which is going to also um, uh, elicit different uh, fuel utilizations and fuel partitioning, right? So when we start exercising very easily, like a very easy walk, for example, or, or a very easy bike ride for those ones who are fit on the bike, um, the body prefers to use fat for energy purposes. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't use glucose, right? Because we, we also use uh, glucose. Uh, the, the, there is a miscon. Uh, misconception that at low intensities we do not use glucose we do use glucose and this is i've been for almost two decades uh, measuring in the laboratory fat and carbohydrate oxidation rates at, 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 at the wide range of exercise intensities all the exercise intensities and seeing in grams per minute how much uh, uh, how many carbohydrates and, and, and fatty acids uh, you uh, burn or oxidize at different intensities, right? Which has helped me tremendously to understand the bioenergetics and metabolic map, as I call, of, of what are the series of events of different intensities. So again, at different at, at, at slow intensity, we, we we deploy a lot of the fat, 
um, um, and then we use a little bit of glucose, right? It's very low intensity, and we we deploy, we recruit the slow twitch muscle fibers. That's what I called uh, zone one, right? Uh, and again, when it comes to zones, the multiple zones, people have different uh, um, terminologies and, and interpretations. So I'm, I'm just giving you mine, right? Um, so, so then as exercise intensity increases, then the, the muscle contraction gets faster, right, and stronger. So uh, it, it, it needs a higher metabolic demand to produce ATP. So that's what uh, you start uh, burning even more fat, right? But you also start burning more glucose also, but uh, not as much uh, fluctuation in glucose uh, utilization as it is in fat, right? So, And this, so- this glucose at this stage is being being used to produce energy within the mitochondria. All of this is still occurring in the mitochondria. Normally, yes, because it's uh, the glycolytic flux, as we call, uh, it allows the velocity of the glucose to be used uh, through pyruvate in mitochondria, yes. Uh, although some is uh, reduced or transformed to lactate in, in the cytosol of the cell, and therefore uh, there's a little bit of lactate production, which is also coincides with this intensity. Little bit, which is about baseline levels, or a little bit about la- baseline levels, right? But but this is where um, uh, at this intensity that I call zone two, this is where you um, uh, reach a point where you oxidize the highest amount of fat, right? Um, and and this is a key point because uh, fat is oxidized exclusively in mitochondria, right? So when you reach a point where you ha- um, achieve the maximum fat oxidation is like, yeah, you're putting those mitochondria to work at that uh, bioenergetic system, which is the the fatty acid oxidation and uh, oxidative phosphorylation to the max. So this is what I I use this zone uh, to prescribe exercise as this is what I see that this is where you oxidize the most amount of fat. So we can see uh, in many people, when we do this test in the laboratory, we can see that this um, we can we can translate this into heart rate, for example, or into pace or into power, um, so that 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 is the exercise intensity that releases the highest fat oxidation. Um, then we we start we continue increasing the uh, exercise intensity, and the metabolic demand it becomes even larger right so you need to produce ATP faster and this is where there, there's an inflection point where fat cannot um, uh, continue producing ATP at the same rate as before so this is where glucose uh, um, is um, called in uh, at a higher rate because uh, ATP from glucose uh, is produced signif- significantly faster than from fat, right? So that's when glucose starts to be recruited. And then you see in, 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 in the laboratory at this intensity, you see that um, um, a fat starts to drop significantly. There's a significant drop in fat oxidation and there's a significant increase in um, um, glucose um, oxidation or utilization. And, and at the same time, you see also a, an inflection point also for lactate because lactate and glucose go together as i was saying earlier it's about glucose flux the higher the glucose flux into the cell the higher the lactate accumulation right so so this is what's starting to happen in this zone three that i call which is a transition zone before we enter a a whole different um um, uh, bioenergetic uh, terrain which is glycolysis Right, um, uh, or, 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 yeah, what the glycolytic system. So this is when uh, exercise intensity is now so hard that fat can no longer provide ATP, uh, or, or, uh, you know, like, or be a substrate for ATP production. Right, and this is when uh, you need to uh, start deploying um, um, uh, fat. I mean, carbohydrates and glucose. And this is what we see that at this intensity, fat oxidation completely disappears. Uh, it's gone. At the same time, uh, you see an, uh, a big increase in glucose oxidation and a sharp increase in uh, lactate uh, because of the glucose flux. And this is also what lactate also has 
the uh, um, uh, endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine um, uh, functions. So the, the endocrine function of lactate is that when accumulates in the cell and cannot be metabolized in mitochondria, it goes to the blood. And it goes to the blood, it inhibits lipolysis, uh, which is the breakdown of fatty acids from adipose tissue. So when it inhibits lipolysis, you're not going to be able in the first place to, to bring the, the, the fatty acids to, to the muscles to be burned, right? And then secondly, and we, we have published this recently two years ago, that we saw and we demonstrated that lactate as an autocrine um, a function, it also inhibits the fatty acid transporter. So in, 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 in the muscles, fatty acids, they, they have a door, which are the CPT1 and CPT2. In, my, in mitochondria, outside and inside mitochondria, they transport fatty acids, right? So lactate inhibits both doors. So when you have a high glycolytic uh, flux and you use a lot of glucose, the fat disappears for several reasons. First, because of necessity to produce ATP, right, at a faster rate. And second, because the uh, uh, actions of lactate on both adipose tissue and also on, on the transporters for fat. So it's a way to to uh, a fit forward mechanism, right? To to kind of get fat out of the way and say, "Hey, fat, you're done. Your job is done. Now we go into glucose." And this is what I call the zone four, right? Uh, or people call also lactate threshold. Although there are many interpretations of lactate threshold also, of or FTP, functional threshold power, etc. Right? And then, but all this is aerobic. All this is 100% aerobic uh, metabolism, right? Although this is what I was mentioning earlier, the misconception is like we're already in the anaerobic state, and that's why people call it anaerobic threshold, right? We're still aerobic, right? Then we move on into the the, the next uh, phase, which is it's 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 an intensity that this is where you reach your view two max. This is an intensity where uh, uh, you max your aerobic capacity. Right, your lactate it's off the chart. Your your glucose utilization and the glucose flux in in the cell is off the chart. There's no fat oxidation either, but you're you're at at the, at the intensity where you um, uh, have the highest aerobic capacity, uh, and and this is the VO2 max, and I call that the zone five, right? And then lastly, we call I call the zone six, which is pure anaerobic. Uh, this is when we're talking about sprinting or about efforts that last two or three minutes, right? Where uh, that um, oxygen that you were referring to earlier is not enough, uh, or even glucose is not enough to to maintain. I mean, to synthesize ATP and 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 then the muscles they need the ATP that is stored in the muscles already without the need of of, of oxygen. Okay, I have a lot of questions. That was beautifully explained let me let me try and summarize some of that and you can let me know if i've got anything wrong um but at at lower intensities the body is is using the oxidative phosphorylation system this aerobic energy production system whereby energy is being produced within the mitochondria and at at very low intensities that's primarily but not exclusively being being done by using fat as a substrate there is some glucose and that's uh, fat is predominating as the substrate of choice at sort of zone one and two. And then as you start to go up above zone two, you start to see an increase in the amount of aerobic glycolysis. So using glucose to produce uh, ATP within the mitochondria and the oxidation of fat starts to go down as you go up from zone th- three to zone four. But all of this is still aerobic. And then... Once you go into zone five, you start to get this anaerobic glycolysis. So we're now able to produce ATP from glucose without the presence of oxygen. Um, and then above that, is that where the phosphocreatine system would kick in, the, the sort of third energy system? Yeah, the ATP phosphocreatine, yes, exactly. Is is what's stored in the muscle already and it doesn't require oxygen. For that, yeah, and that's a pure aerobic uh, system that we have, right? Everything else is aerobic. There, there are some like uh, sparks of an, an, an aerobic metabolism, right? But, but yeah, this is like a 
the, the predominant is always aerobic. How does somebody know, right, if they're in the right zone without measuring their heart rate? This study kind of showed that even though they thought they were getting an excellent workout because they checked for like perceived enjoyment, how hard it was, all these things, they said, this is great. Like there was a great workout. It was very hard, blah, blah, blah. But really, when you look at their heart rate, they never got to the same heart rates as the evidence-based protocols. So it's not enough to think you trained really hard. And literally the same thing happened to me this morning at this endurance event. I thought it was such a hard workout. I was ready to see how much percentage was in zone five and it was like less than 1%. So it's not enough to be breathing heavy and hurting. You've got to have some objective feedback. Mm. So and you I need think, to really look at your heart rate. I think rate. you need to measure your heart rate. Okay. Yeah. So then let's, let's break this down for people and this is also going to help with the zone two calculations. How does someone calculate their max heart rate? We've spoken about this a little bit before and we've spoken a lot offline. 220 minus age is the common calculation that everyone's heard but there are better calculations. Mm. So how do you, how, how would you like people to kind of navigate that space to step step one, the listener right now, calculate their max heart rate, short of not having a wearable that's telling them what their max heart rate is. Right. By the way, I think the wearables use an equation that is the simple one. I'm pretty sure most wearables would just use 220 minus your age because when you have start your profile, you tell them your age, they just do a quick calculation. There are so many calculations out there to calculate max heart rate. Um, the one that I have been leaning on, I can't remember the exact numbers here. It's a bit numbery. We it's, can put the, we the can, exact calculations in. Because the there's, there's, there's dozens, but it's something like, do you remember? Well, there was a, a, a one for females and one for males. Right. There's also gender specific ones. Gulati well. was the female one. Right. Um, the Carvernon method is for heart rate reserve, which we spoke about. That takes into account your resting heart rate. So either way, there's going to be, in the show notes, there'll be a calculation yeah. for male and for female. I think it wasn't it like 200, 208 minus 0. 0.7 times age or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then 211. To, right. And there was a 209. Like it was, right. They're all close. At the end of the day, no matter which one you use, they're going to be pretty much one or two or three beats off what you probably are. And again, just remember, this is a calculation. Th- this, this calculator does not know your actual physical ability or your fitness or how your heart is developed and it doesn't know. So you, it might spit out 185 as your max heart rate. You might then jump on a VO2 test and it shows you that it's like 200 beats per minute. So it doesn't know. It's a ballpark, which again, I'm in support of what Inigo was saying is heart rate alone is not good enough as a measure for the intensity of your workouts because of this exact thing. There's variation between individuals. The calculations for max could be a little bit off. Anyway, theoretically, you're going to calculate your max heart rate using one of these calculations. And all you need to know for that is your age and your sex. That's it. Correct. You're going to use that if you want. If you want to keep this really simple, you're going to try keep your heart rate between about 60 to 70. We'll say 60 to 70 because that's like the popularized version of zone two. 60 to 70% of that number, your max heart rate, is your target zone. So you're going to jump on the bike, start pedaling. It'll take a little. It'll take a few minutes to get into zone two. I don't know if you've checked this for yourself. It's really interesting. Sometimes it takes me like 10, 15 minutes to get into to, to the like perfect zone two. Um, spend your workout in zone two, meaning in that heart rate range, and cross check with a few other variables. Right. So you're going to see. Do you pass a talk test? If there was a mate next to you on a bike or if you're on the phone, could you have a conversation? Sure, you're going to be a bit puffy, but you should be able to talk, right? In comparison, if you're doing a zone five hit workout, you'll barely be able to say a word, right? You're really exhausted. Um, if you can try the nasal breathing, I recommend that because that, that'll regulate your intensity naturally. Um, as soon as you, Or even do this test. This is interesting. Push to zone, so sit in zone two, nasal breathe, and then crank up your either your reps per minute, your how quickly you're pedaling, your cadence, or crank up the resistance a little bit. So your your RPM might drop, but the resistance is up. We're so talking your body, about a bike here, a stationary a bike. bike. I'm talking about stationary bike, and then go hard and see your heart rate go into zone three and four, and you you won't be able to nasal breathe. You literally will almost pass out. You'll have to open your mouth and start taking in big breaths. So I think, man, I think just let's keep it simple. Have a, have a target heart rate. 
know how to do the talk test and all these things. Um, and then the same, so that was zone two, which was calculate your max heart rate using those calculations we'll put in the show notes. You multiply that max heart rate by 0.6 mm-hmm. and also by 0.7. Yep. That'll give you your your lower bound and your upper bound for your zone two. Yep. It'll give you a range. Like it might spit out 110 to 122. Right. Right, that's your zone two target range. Yeah. Now you uh, you can track your heart rate with your wearable while you're riding. Do the the torque test. Yep. Can you breathe through your nose? Can yep. you uh, are you a little bit puffy, a little bit sweaty? Yep. That's enough for most people. And simple. and then the next step for them is to think about the duration in that session and across an entire week. Right. And what does that look like? We come back to that. Right. For zone five, you. Also take that max heart rate. Yep. But instead of multiplying it by the 0.6 and 0.7, which gave you your zone two target range, mm-hmm. we're multiplying by... I like 0.85. Okay. So you take that max heart rate, you multiply by 0.85, and that's where you want your heart rate to be... Above. Above that. In your working sets. During those four-minute intervals. Yes. Or if you're doing the 60 on, 60 off version that we just explained, during that 60 seconds, try get it above. And the reason why it's it, the reason why this it works for a sixty second interval and it works for a four minute interval is because of the work to rest ratio. It's all about that ratio. This is a one to one ratio. So in the sixty seconds off, let's say let's say you get your heart rate to ninety percent in that in that hard working set, it's not going to drop that low in sixty seconds off, right? It's not long enough to really recover and get it close to rest. Right? Your intensity is going to be higher in that sixty on sixty off than a four minute interval. Yeah, because you don't have to really ramp up into it. After three minutes of active rest, if you're fit, you're ready to go. Like it's almost like, like I did this on the rowing machine. And at two minutes, I, I, I was like, I feel ready. I'm going to check the clock. And I was like, yeah, I've got another minute of rest. And I was like, this doesn't feel right. I feel like I'm ready right now. So yeah, I think that this, I, I reckon this protocol would feel harder just because the rest is shorter for sure. But back to the minimum effective volume. So I think earlier you said, even if you you can get some positive adaptations if you do a four minute high intensity interval session once a week, yeah, that's four minutes consecutively. What right. if I choose the sixty second on sixty off? Mm. If I repeat that four times, mm-hmm. so I have four minutes of total work, is that equivalent to doing a four minute? Yeah, interval? I think yeah. If your time in range is above eighty five and it's equivalent, I think it would be. Um, but I, I also I don't know the answer to what the minimum effective dose is for this sort of training. To be honest, I don't know. I think four minutes would be enough to get some adaptation. What's optimal? I don't know. I remember seeing one study, and we can dig it up. Yeah. I think it was people with metabolic syndrome, and it compared one four minute interval versus right. three or four, mm-hmm. and most of the benefit was from just doing the ones. Right. But there was some extra benefit, of course. But it was a it was diminishing returns. Exactly right. That's why I'm saying the optimal dose, I'm not sure what the answer is. But I do know that if you just did one hit work, like a, a, an evidence-based protocol per week, which they roughly last 20 minutes on average, 20 to 30 minutes. If you do that once a week and you truly do it properly, I think that's enough. I don't, I don't think you need to be doing it every day. Certainly not. So if I just want to start off with four minutes a week and I, and I choose either the four-minute consecutive protocol or the 60 on, 60 off – and I, I walk into the gym, and I'm going to do this on a rowing machine. You said then it takes about 20 minutes. Now, I, I know the answer to this question, but I think we need to spell this out. Yeah. I'm not going to walk in there and just go straight into the four-minute interval. No, you're definitely not. You're going to, you're going to do a, a, a warm-up, ideally on the machine that you intend to do the workout on. So what does that look like? So what I like to do, I have what I call a ramp protocol. I put this in my book, in the training program. And this ramp protocol I use for before weights training and I use it before cardio training if it's high intensity training. I don't do a ramp protocol for the zone two because zone two is the intensity of your warm up essentially, right? So the warm up should be in basically zone two. Okay, so what I would do is jump on a rowing machine for four to five minutes at a really nice zone one, two pace. Start in zone one, ease your way into zone two, try to spend about four or five minutes in zone two on a machine. You just want to feel puffy, a little bit sweaty and warm, right? Just build that sweat and feel like your body temperature is actually increased. Then 
I like to get off and do a little bit of mobility and stretching, right? So I'll do some like active and dynamic stuff just to get the muscles moving and then get back on the machine and you're going to do a quite a hard set of only like 10 or 15 strokes at say 60% of your max. Then you're going to do another set at about 70%, then 80%. Then when you feel primed, start your workout. That's when you're going to do that four minute interval and going nice and hard. But yeah, you're not going to just show up to the gym, jump on a machine mm-hmm. and start sprinting. And if you have just finished your zone two, you've done an hour of zone two, can you go straight into the hit? Like if they're doing what you're you're doing where you'll do zone two on a bike and then jump on a rowing machine, I would still prime your body for the rowing. Ramp up a little bit. Ramp a little bit. Do 20 seconds or 15 seconds quite hard. Then do another 15 seconds a little bit harder and just ramp your way up to the intensity mm-hmm. that you think you're going to be pulling for four minutes or whatever the interval is that you're doing. Okay, so let's try and wrap all of this up. I'm conscious of trying to give people some takeaways they can grab a hold of. Yeah, like <laughs> the, real practical takeaways. Right, yeah. the last episode was very uh, in-depth science. I'm not sure whether we've added it a lot of clarity yet <laughs> hopefully we no, have. i think i think we have hopefully we have yeah uh, i just don't want to leave people more confused no. um then then before they turn this episode on yeah, so enough. the 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 main points here that we we're making is that you can be very intentional with the cardiovascular training that you're doing yes and understanding your max heart rate to begin with is a good starting point you can use that to then understand what is your zone two, what is your zone five. When you're in zone two, you're not just going to be relying on heart rate. You're also relying on some of these other cues. Mm -hmm. Can you talk? Are you a bit puffy? Can you breathe through your nose? All that sort of stuff. Someone has, let's say, how much time do you think the average person has a week to dedicate to cardiovascular training? Just to cardiovascular? Again, it comes down to personal goals. Like some people, do, they, their goal is strong, get stronger or get bigger, right? Hypertrophy. Some people don't care about cardio. In fact, there's this like... I'm thinking about the person who is interested in their health span optimization right. and longevity. Yeah. That's who I'm thinking about right here. Yeah. And let's say they have five hours a week Mm. and half of that or two, two and a half hours of that is resistance training. Yeah. So they have two and a half hours to do cardiovascular exercise. Yeah. Are they doing 80% of that in zone two? Is that that where we're sort of guiding them at the moment? Well, this is a good example because what you just said there is basically 150 minutes for zone two, oh, sorry, for cardiovascular training and 150 minutes for resistance training. I think that's a great way to do it. I think that th- that's a nice split. It's balanced. You're going to get the best of both worlds. You don't. I don't think you have to spend 80% in zone two, to be honest, If in that example. If you're only dealing with 150 minutes per week, I don't think it should all, well, at least the vast majority should be in zone two. I, I just don't think that makes all, the, all that sense. I, I think... I think the way that I explained it before actually is is a better way. It's that you have a, a dedicated workout for zone two. You have a dedicated workout for a sort of three and four and a dedicated workout for zone five. I like that. But at the end of the day, again, we're getting into the weeds. If you just have 20 to 30 minutes a day that you think you can do some cardio, I really think that the most important thing is that you just do it. And I don't think that it really matters as to what zone you're in and what percentage because you're going to get amazing benefits. This is, where, this is, I think, where the conversation with Inigo got a little bit complicated, is you're always going to get benefits from all kinds of training. Some of them are more unique than others, but generally speaking, all of this cardio is going to improve your VO2 max. HIT is a more time-efficient way to do it and will improve your cardio respiratory fitness more when you compare HIT to, to, to moderate intensity, but it doesn't mean you don't get benefits from moderate intensity. Right And yes, when you do moderate intensity, you may improve mitochondrial function more than if you only did very high intensity, but you're still getting benefit from the high intensity. Mm-hmm. So it's not black and white. It's not an on-off switch. But if you're the more strapped <clears throat> you are for time, yeah, then the more you 
may want to lean into the higher intensities. Yeah, if you only have like fit, some people do their cardio on the day that they're at the gym doing resistance training. If you're if somebody who, who does that, you're not going to do 60 minutes of zone two and then 45 minutes of weights, right? So what what could you do? Do your weights for 30 minutes and then do 15 to 20 minutes of hit, like really go hard, because then you're making the most of that hour. You're definitely going to get the best of of all worlds if you can do that. That's where hit training is very appealing to people from a, a, an ROI in terms of time invested. Yeah, and studies look at this. They look at exactly this. So they look at moderate intensity continuous training. What is the impact on VO2 max? And they look at hit training, the impact on VO2 max, and it's more time efficient. You can achieve a VO2 in less time. And it's something like an average of like, have you, have you seen these studies? Like 9.7 minutes per session less to reach an equivalent VO2 max improvement. So if you're time strapped, the uh, HIIT training is a great way to, to get a great workout. Hey friends, if you'd like to stay connected and reinforce the valuable insights from this show, let's connect on Instagram. You can find me at Simon Hill. That's at Simon Hill. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's dive back into the episode. So the first one here that I have is Alex. She's a 30-year-old woman, not on oral contraception, um, not a professional athlete, but as you just said then, still an athlete. She trains four or five times a week, and her, her goal is to be strong, healthy, and quote-unquote toned. I pulled this from some of the questions that were submitted to me, um, which I guess means lean muscle without too much body fat. I think that's what she's going for. So my first question here is for Alex, this 30-year-old woman. How does she go about assessing her current sort of health and status, her fitness, whether her hormone profile is optimal, et cetera? Okay. So the first thing is tracking menstrual cycle. So, you know, find out what day one is and find out actually how long your cycle is. Along that, you can use an app. You can also use the old fertility method of basal body temperature. So you can see where your core temperature drops and then surges. So that indicates an ovulatory cycle. Um, Once you are understanding how long your cycle is and if it changes, then we also want you to kind of keep track of your sleep and your training according to where you are in your menstrual cycle. Because you'll start to see patterns. You'll start to understand the days you feel really good and the days maybe not so much. The best way I can describe of the kind of epiphany that happens there is now women feel empowered instead of doing self blame of, I didn't sleep well enough. I didn't push hard enough. Oh, I shouldn't have gone to that class. I was too tired. They start to see these patterns and like, I didn't do well in that hot yoga class or I didn't do well in that, um, boot camp class because it's on day 25 of my cycle. And every time I hit day 25, I'm really flat. So next time I'm not going to do it on that day. I'm going to do it on day 18 where I feel fantastic. So I can really push and get that training adaptation. So it's understanding your own patterns within your menstrual cycle. If you really want to dig down and see um, like what your hormone profile is, if you are not at, get at risk of low energy availability, we say get an estrogen or estradiol test on day two and a progesterone test on day 21 because these are the two metrics that will give you an indication of what estrogen and progesterone are doing and what the ratios are. What day was that for progesterone? Day 21. Day 21. So day two for estradiol, day 21 for progesterone. Progesterone, yep. Okay. Yep. What about testosterone? How how important is testosterone for a 30-year-old woman? It's the under-discussed but pretty important hormone. We know that testosterone is pretty stable through a woman's life and has a slow decline like men, but we also see a lot of perturbance in it. Um, so just having tr- keeping track over the course of time will give you a better snapshot. So if you are starting to feel really flat and you're like, what's going on? And nothing, you're not in low energy availability, your estrogen and progesterone look fine. Then we say, you know, really get a a testosterone test and let's see what's going on. You should fall within a a normal range. 
Um, and then you can keep that. And then you can see, am I building it or am I, am I not? Because that one point in time isn't going to tell much. We need to look at the trends. Sure. Um, yeah. And the day two estradiol test and day 21 progesterone, what are the, the types of results that would be a bit of a, a red flag where you'd be like, okay, there's, there's something that maybe isn't quite right here? Yeah. So for estradiol, there's a baseline level where we know that it is still within the normal range for follicular. So we expect it to be low, but we don't expect it to bottom out what we see in um, postmenopausal women, amenorrheic women. Um, because then this is an indication of something's going on from an ovarian standpoint. For progesterone, if we don't see an elevation in progesterone that indicates that it is starting to peak, then we know it's an anovulatory cycle. And of the 12 to 14 cycles that a woman will have in a year, three or four of them are going to be anovulatory. So if you get like a really low progesterone, then get it retested the next month and see what happens. Uh, a lot of the norms within those ranges are pretty good and standard for active women. When we start to see really significant perturbances within estrogen and progesterone, then we go, okay, well now we need to get a luteinizing hormone test because if we don't see a pulse and we don't see a surge in luteinizing hormone, then we know that there's a low energy um, issue here and we want to stop that before it is full relative energy deficiency in sport. Gotcha. Yeah, that was, I was going to ask you that. So to diagnose red S, um, do you do you need that blood test and that super low estradiol level, or can it can it be diagnosed just through, I guess, the history of the the person knowing that they've lost their period, among other things? Yeah. So when we're looking at relative energy deficiency in sport, there's so many things that go in, in it. So we see a psychological component where there's lots of depression and anxiety. We see a lot of gut issues, um, sudden uh, incidents of IBS, or, you know, just people think they need to go gluten-free or FODMAP because they're starting to have a lot of GI issues. We see cardiovascular missteps. So there's higher inflammatory markers. So CRP is elevated. And then we also see the tipping point of menstrual cycle irregularities. So you might be uh, ir regularly irregular, meaning that you're still getting your cycles, but there's been a change within your own cycle. So that's a red flag for us. When we start to see some of those, we're like, okay, first, instead of blood tests, let's try to look at nutrient timing. How are you fueling for your workouts and how are you recovering from them? Because this is a sex difference that is often not really discussed, where women don't do well in fasted training. We see that a lot of women who do fasted training end up with greater fat accumulation, higher cortisol levels, which feeds forward to greater um, inflammatory responses, poor sleep, and it's a cascading effect. We know that women do better with some food on board. So it doesn't mean you have to get up at 4.30 and have a big breakfast before you work out at 5.30, but you have something on board. That signals the brain that there's some nutrition coming in. And there are two areas in the brain in the hypothalamus for women that are sensitive to nutrition, nutrition status, where there's only one in men. That's why we see all this fasting data coming out of being so spectacular. Again, it's from male data. So when someone is starting to experience those menstrual cycle irregularities, we're like, okay, it's a it's an energy status. So let's really nail down that nutrition in and around training. Get your body out of a breakdown state. Because if you delay food after exercise, then your body is staying in a catabolic state and your brain perceives that as low energy. Even if you think you're eating enough calories, but you're not eating them in the right time during the day, your body can still fall into this perception of low energy availability. First, we get that nutrient timing going. We see how that works over the next two to three weeks with regards to energy, to sleep. And then we see how that feeds forward into subsequent cycles. If we're still not having any luck, that's when we start really digging into the endocrine, looking at estrogen, progesterone, luteinizing hormone pulse, all of that cascade to then really nail down how far down the track are we with low energy availability and red S and how are we going to pull you out of it? How equipped is the average endocrinologist to kind of help someone 
go through this? Is it an endocrinologist that someone would go and see to get that that sort of level of hormone profiling done? Um, what are your recommendations? If someone's listening now and thinking, yeah, you know, some, some of what Stacey's talking about here is affecting me, I need to dig into this. How do they dig into it? Who is the type of person that can help them? help guide them. Of course, you've got a lot of resources, I know, but if they were wanting to go and see a, a kind of doctor in their local area. Yeah. Um, it's hard because there are a lot of sports physicians who still aren't acutely aware of some of the changes. So often what we do is we get a sports physician to refer to an endocrinologist that specializes in fertility. Because if you're specializing in fertility, you understand the pulses of the hormones. And so when you start to see irregularities, then they can report back, okay, this is what's going on. And there's some menstrual cycle dysfunction. If you just go to a basic endocrinologist who doesn't have the depth of understanding of how all these hormones interact, then you might not get an, an accurate diagnosis or the kind of help that you really need. And red S, so relative energy deficiency syndrome, that's what it stands for, right? Mm -hmm. um, Correct me if I'm wrong. So the amenorrhea or the irregular periods that you just spoke about there is sort of the body's response to not having sufficient energy. So essentially um, in that state, it goes into almost like survival mode that it's, it's not really in the uh, appropriate physiological state to be thinking about reproduction. Exactly. Is that, is that right? Yep. Yep. And what are some of the risks of that if you're in that? What are some of the, I guess, medium to long-term risks for a woman if she finds herself in that position? Yeah, unfortunately, it's still that pervasive myth in the sporting communities that if you lose your period, then you're training hard enough and you're ready to go. Um, but what we see is if you are amenorrheic defined by three months of no period, then you are increased for bone stress fractures increased risk of um, inflammatory responses, poor cardiovascular function, um, poor recovery, and then we see a plateau and a decrease in performance. So long-term health risks are reversible if you are willing to really step back and be like, okay, I need to take care of my nutrition to get my um, hormones back in sync because we say, you know, a period is an ergogenic aid if you're naturally cycling because it's the first thing that will go kind of to the wayside when there's a misstep between energy in, energy out, or your stress. So we closely monitor it, um, not only in elite athletes, but recreational female athletes as well. We've done a couple of studies and we've seen up to 55% of recreational female athletes are in low energy availability, subclinical, and they're starting to have menstrual cycle irregularities, but they're like, oh, I'm stressed. That's what it is. But they're putting themselves into a higher risk for low bone density, poor um, muscle function, and when they hit peri and postmenopause, a rapid loss of lean mass. Do you have a sense for, if we're talking about the recreational um, sort of athlete here, female athlete, do you have a sense for the contribution from training, whether this is, is it an overtraining problem or more so an underfueling and um, women just not being aware about, you know, what types of nutrients and how much they need to eat to be able to um, to complement the exercise that they're doing or is it sleep what, what what contribution would each of those be playing to red syndrome? That's a hard one to tease out. I know Trent Stellingworth put out a paper recently looking at overtraining versus red S and how similar they are. If we're looking at uh, recreational athletes, we've done kind of the combination of transdisciplinary looking at sociocultural aspects and the physiological. And right now, because there's such misinformation through the internet or word of mouth that there are so many different diet trends, that tends to be the big influence on what's happening in recreational female athletes, where they're doing a lot of intermittent fasting or they're doing a lot of exclusionary diet stuff or, um, you know, they're like, oh, I'm FODMAP, so I can't have this, which falls into the exclusionary. And then that kind of compounds the effect they're also trying to do a lot of high intensity work now a lot of resistance training and high intensity work because those are the buzzwords and so there's just this 
significant misstep in understanding the energy needs for getting adaptation and getting what you want from your fitness with and the energy needs for staying healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, What women don't like to hear is that in order to get those adaptations, you need abundance. You want to build lean mass, you need abundance of calories because your body isn't going to encourage to build lean mass, which is metabolically hungry, if you yourself are not giving your body what it needs, just to have basic endocrine health. So that's the, I guess, the idea behind like, what is it? What are the tipping points? You know, it's, it's hard to really tease out, is it the high intensity and resistance training or is it the diet trends? Because both of them come together because they're both the buzzwords and we're finding a lot of women are following that. And there's just a significant misstep of information. Quick one. If you would like to see me break down wild claims from social media influencers, be sure to follow me on Instagram. You can find me by searching at Simon Hill. See you there. What about body fat percentage and and, and where that sh- you know, should be or what's healthy, what's realistic. So in this sort of avatar I mentioned there, this idea of quote unquote being toned. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, something that many women are sort of aspiring to. Um, what does that actually mean? What is healthy for a 30-year-old woman from a body fat percentage and how may that differ to a 30-year-old man? Yeah, so we look from a healthy range. It depends not only on like total body fat, but where it's distributed. So a woman who is 30 might have 25% body fat, but it's all lower body. And that's not as harmful as if she is 25% body fat and it's all in the abdominal region. So we have to look at, at morphology and, you know, where is that, that being stored? Um, we say that women who are healthy around 30, it's between 22 and 26% body fat is a healthy range. But for men, it's between 16 and 20%. So when we start to see things like um, athletes are like, oh, you know, I dropped down to 12% body fat for my races. It's like, okay, well, we know that there's a lot of misstep and you're right on the cusp of being sick because your body percent is a little bit too low. We like to see women periodize their body composition as well. Um, start heavier at the beginning of any kind of race season or any kind of competition season so they can afford to lose it as high intensity and stress comes on and stay healthy. Same with men. But for women, we really want to push the issue that you can't stay at one particular number because the body isn't an algorithm. It mm. fluctuates and it's healthy to do that. Right. Is, is that something you would encourage people to keep an eye on with a DEXA scan? For DEXA, it's more about bone health and body fat distribution. Instead of investing in a DEXA, um, it's more about the kind of resistance training you're doing. Because we know that to really shift that abdominal fat, women need to lift heavy in the power range when they're premenopausal, because that really helps mobilize abdominal fat better than any kind of cardiovascular aspect. Um, as we get older in peri and postmenopause, it's a different story of how we mobilize that abdominal fat or prevent visceral fat from um, actually coming on. Uh, so when we talk about recomp, it's like, okay, fuel, resistance training, and then there can be blocks of time where we're doing a slight calorie restriction to really recomp the body. But then you want to phase calories back in again because we want to periodize. And we can see that, you know, naturally your body puts on more fat when it's cold and wintry as part of survival, but also circadian rhythm and darkness. And then over the summer, your body will naturally lose more fat because you're exposed more to light. And that's normal. But we can kind of maximize those effects by how we're training and how we're treating our bodies. Mm -hmm. Recomp, if someone's not familiar with that term, what does that mean? Body recomp. So that's increasing lean mass and decreasing body fat. Mm-hmm. Okay, so coming back to Alex here, yeah. um, what what would a week of training for someone like her, recreational, just wanting to be fit, strong, get a bit leaner, what would what would a, a kind of training program look like in terms of the different modalities or type of exercise, sort of frequency, duration, and how might that change? I guess, week to week based on her menstrual cycle. Okay. So if we look at the first week of the menstrual cycle, um, I'm going to 
just do an assumption that she doesn't have any really bad cramping. Or maybe we could say the first two days, she has really bad cramping and doesn't feel like doing much. So in those first two days, a lot of women are like, Ugh. and if you do a couple of 20 second intervals, so not Tabata, but really high intensity, full gas kind of sprint interval training, and it can be running up your stairs just so you get those 20 second bursts, it creates a growth hormone and anti-inflammatory response, which then feeds forward to reducing cramping. And if you do that for your cycles, your body starts to learn that we don't have to have as much intensity of the cramping and inflammation. So it's a good modality to kind of get through the cramping and still kind of feel like you're working on your fitness. On day three, still bleeding, but she feels fantastic. So day three, all the way up to ovulation, this is where we can hit it hard. So we're looking from a resistance standpoint. Uh, we look at you know, two to three times a week of compound movements. So one of those can be more Olympic lifting and power-based movements. Two of those can be, um, you know, a total body where we're looking at sets of, uh, or sorry, reps of six to eight. Mm -hmm. So we're looking again in that power phase because we're trying to get that strength and speed because this is where the body really can take that on. Um, from an endure or from a cardiovascular standpoint, this is where you can also do high intensity interval training, but real high intensity interval training where your intervals are 80% or more max. You're hitting, you know, one to three minutes for your interval. You could also do some sprint interval training if you wanted, but it's all about that top end quality and it's not doing it every day. So we're looking at, you know, two or you know, two to three lifting sessions that are properly designed for power. And you can look at two at the most three high intensity sessions and you can back that up after you're lifting if you want or before you're lifting if you're doing sprint interval. So it's not a lot of time, right? And then after ovulation, we start to look more from an aerobic capacity standpoint. So this is where your lifting becomes more total body, but you're falling into maybe four sets of eight, no more than eight. Um, from a, a cardiovascular standpoint, you can start looking at steady state work. So you're doing five or so minutes of steady state work. And then about the five days before the period starts, this is where we look at deloading where you don't want to disrupt your pattern that you have during your week of going to the gym and when you go to the gym. So this is where we look at technique under the bar, working on drills, working on mobility, uh, doing a lot of re recovery modalities so that you are working with the fact that your immune system has changed, your neurotransmitters are making a little bit more tired, your body's in a breakdown state and an inflammatory state. So let's work on that technique. Let's work on the cognition. Let's work on the skills. So then when we hit it hard in the next follicular phase, that feeds forward into better lifting technique, better running technique. Got you. Okay, great. So just to summarize that, you had day one, two, when there may be cramping, that's util utilizing that sort of hit tool that 20 second hit proper hit protocol mm -hmm. then you had day three to ovulation which is where your training intensity goes up you're hitting it a bit, a bit harder um, that resistance training in that sort of six to eight rep range and i'm assuming that you're choosing a weight such that when you get to six to eight reps you only have a few in reserve is that kind of the goal there actually trying to get to fatigue in that okay. because if so, we look after ovulation we're hitting the eight that's where you have a few in reserve okay. but we're really trying to get to that failure for a little bit of hypertrophy but just that neuromuscular connection mm -hmm. for stronger strength and power okay so you're working really hard there intensity's up after ovulation is when the intensity comes off it's more sort of aerobic and you've got the four sets of eight in terms of resistance training, but you have a few reps in reserve, steady state cardiovascular training, and then five days before period starts is when you're deloading and really taking taking the foot off the accelerator. The intensity comes down. If Alex is thinking, I usually do functional training, and and you use the word real hit there and i had a yes. bit of, i had a bit of a chuckle on the inside so um and and i'm pretty familiar with the this sort of hit literature and i have always um chuckled myself at how different the protocols are in the literature versus say sometimes how we see it in the community um yeah is there a is there a problem if alex said look 
you know, I I just go and do a 45 minute sort of functional hit training session four or five times a week. Um, would there be a, a sort of problem with doing that versus what you've just put forward? Not really a problem, but you're not maximizing what you can get out of it. If you are looking from the social construct of I want to go to these classes because I see my friends, I know the instructor, it's a time in my diary where it's just me and I can relax. Remember that you are paying for this class, so you want to make it work for you. So if it's a 45 minute boot camp functional training type thing, you can change your weights to make them lighter or heavier. You can change the intensity of the sprints that they have you do to work according to your cycle, mm -hmm. right? Bear in mind also, the reason why I want her to track her cycle first is so that she can see what days she feels really, really powerful and strong, and which days maybe not so much. So she can work that in too. Because I've just given like the general schematic of how we work with the immune system and metabolism and stuff. But knowing that some women feel super fantastic right around ovulation and other women feel flat for couple of days and then they feel bulletproof same with a few days right before their period starts those hormones have already dropped just haven't started bleeding yet and so they feel fantastic use that to your advantage as well so it's that individual scope within it that you're putting into that generalization and so that also comes into the classes that you're already going to because i don't want to take away someone's soul food of socialization and having fun and that kind of stuff but within that class use it to your body's advantage. Just don't go, oh, okay, we're doing lots of box jumps or box step ups with a lightweight. It's like, okay, I know I can hit it hard. So I'm going to use twice the weight that they're recommending. And I'm going to do maybe three less reps. Mm -hmm. So really, you're still working within the class confines, but you're working for your own body. Right? Yeah, I must say I usually train in a kind of standard gym environment but over summer i was down visiting my brother and i joined into some of these kind of community based classes and I, I did find the community the social aspect really enjoyable so i can see how that is a, a draw card um it's motivating yeah it is and it can yeah. i can see how it can really help with adherence for a certain sort of type of, of personality who may not otherwise get into the gym by themselves and maybe finds that mundane or intimidating. Um, yeah, it's that accountability factor of showing up for your friends and you're right. all like in it together, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I mentioned that in this sort of theoretical example of Alex that she did want to build strength. But let's say, for example, um, Alex said to you, I really enjoy yoga and, and Pilates. Um, would that be enough resistance to to help her build strength and reduce her risk of things like osteoporosis and sarcopenia later in life? I'm going to say no. D despite all the people who rave about yoga and Pilates, they're good for muscle control. And people are like, oh, Pilates is so strong. You know, I, my abs hurt. It's really good core strength. Yes. But when we're looking at strength, for life, and we want to build that strength for life, we have to get that neuromuscular response of nerves coming down, having a lot of acetylcholine cross that gap junction, intervening a whole bunch of fibers to have a really strong contraction, and getting that response that is going to enable the body to withstand um, going through peri and postmenopause because you're going to have that neuromuscular response. Uh, when we're looking from a power perspective and really working in power training, we know from a lot of Brad Schoenfeld's work that women do better in the power-based training, regardless of what age they are. It's just when we're looking at that, you know, sixes rep range, almost a failure that works with the recovery aspect that women's muscle needs from the fatigability aspect. So they get more strength and they also get some hypertrophy that works in the toning as well. Um, I tell people yoga is great, but we don't use it as like the primary means of building strength. We look at it as parasympathetic activation. We look at it as something that you love. Pilates once a week, sure, but you can compound that with some sprint intervals in the evening or something like that. Do women or are women able to handle more volume than men? That's something that I've heard and, and I've always been interested in, in asking someone like you. 
can can women do more sets and and perhaps have greater frequency in in terms of training a particular muscle group? Yes, absolutely. So we look at fatigability. We also look at the muscle metabolism and women's bodies are designed to be very endurant. So they can take on more volume. Um, but then when we start looking at the volume, we also have to look at that dose response too, right? That I was talking about earlier, like women are tending to have to have more of a dose to get the similar response that men have. So volume comes into play there. Like if we're looking at building strength and um, we're do- going head to head with a male partner, relative, of course, right? So women are going to have to do a little bit more in order to have the same outcomes. Right. And forgive me if I if I uh, miss this earlier, but in that sort of day three to ovulation period where the intensity goes up and it's sort of six to eight reps getting you know, all the way to fatigue, is there a, a goal in terms of sets per muscle group? Oh, it's the same adage of the three to five, you know, three to five sets, three to five minutes recovery, right? Um, Yeah. And that's something else a lot of women don't understand when they're just starting to get into the gym because they are doing a lot of superset stuff. They're not actually sitting down and letting the neuromuscular system recover. Is there any reason at all for Alex to be scared of resistance training? I think we're kind of moving away from that, but five, 10 years ago, there was perhaps a little bit of stigma around women lifting heavy weights. You're talking about power. You're talking about six reps, which is not a lot of reps. We're talking heavy load here all the way to to fatigue. Is there any reason for her to be worried about that? No. What I think the big misconception is women are going to get bulky, right? First of all, we need to phase into being able to lift that kind of load with proper technique because we don't want people getting injured. But when we look at the bulk factor, uh, which I think is the worry for so many women, I just want to be toned. I want long lean muscles. I don't want to get bulky. Um, unless you eat a lot, you're not going to get bulky because we don't have as much testosterone that's going to induce that bulkiness. Estrogen is actually our testosterone. And we see perturbations in estrogen as it goes because per- progesterone counters estrogen. So if we're really trying to build lean mass, we have a short window to do it, but you were not going to get bulky. And as soon as you add any kind of cardiovascular work, that that true high intensity work, it dampens that bulk effect. Mm. So there isn't any worry for women to get into the gym. Um, Perception of bulk is also different too. Like Mm. someone might say that I'm bulky and I'm like, really, I'm not, I'm not bulky at all but I just have muscles that show and it looks like I work out in the gym. People are like, oh, wow, you're really bulky. I'm like, "Mm, no. So it's that perception as well. Hey friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide, Plant-Based Ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labneh and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. Let's finish with some practical stuff here. Um, so people can think about the application. I, I think they'll be inspired to walk away from here and, and try it out if they haven't already. If someone has access to a lake or let's say an ocean and they said to you, look, I just want you to give me some advice, some first time advice. I'm a bit fearful of cold, to be honest. I I really couldn't think of anything worse, but I understand that there could be some health benefits here up for grabs. Um, what time of the day am I doing this does that matter what season and to begin with am i kind of just running in and running out or jumping off a pier and jumping out like how should how should i approach this as a beginner yes first of all i am totally with you i would say to that person because i've been there and i've been a a person who just wants to run the other way so i have really studied this from uh from a, a an angle where i I myself needed to convince myself how to do this in the most practical and um, uh, and in a way where I afterwards could motivate myself to come 
and do it again. And I think this is very important because motivation comes from both knowledge, because knowing why this is healthy for you, but you also have to have, uh, you have to reckon that you also have a physical memory. So it's definitely important when you do it and how you do it and the whole associations around it. So with that, I want to say that um, I have actually made, oh, I didn't, I forgot to tell you, Simon, but I have made a course about how to get started with all this and why and how and uh, take people through the whole process of getting started with it. And it's a three week course if people are interested in this so they can get, um, hold my hand or something like that when they, when I teach them in this. But what they can do from if they are totally new, get used to the thought. That is often what I think that people start thinking about the cold water and going into the cold water, having this resistant or rejecting it in the beginning, saying, oh, it's not for me. I, I can hear that it's a good idea, but it's not for me. That is already the beginning. So convincing yourself, getting some knowledge, learning how and why, that is one step. But the day that you decide to go, I would recommend that you go in the morning because or maybe not at seven o'clock in the morning because your core temperature is a half degree lower in the morning, which means that you are already actually cold before you get there. So you could exercise before going into the cold water if you want to, but I would say later in the day, afternoon or afternoon at least, um, that is a good place because then your core temperature has come up a bit, your stress hormones, your coffee has working a bit, and then you are um, more warm and more, you can say, prepped for taking your first plunge. So this is for your first plunge. If you are adapted, it, it doesn't really matter on maybe going before going in the water before bedtime is not a good idea because it's going to activate your sympathetic nervous system and all your stress hormones. But in the morning or later in the afternoon, I would suggest that. Okay. And when that person first enters the water, so this person has never been in, in water this cold before. Okay. So when they, when they enter the water, uh, can you kind of walk them through what they're going to experience so they know what's what's normal and they know that what they're experiencing is normal and what to do it's completely normal to be a little bit fearful before you step into the cold water and you haven't done this before especially if it's an open sea because the water moves and it's probably dark and uh, but a cold plunge is more you can see through the water so you kind of know what's in there so your fear is going to be different depending on where you go in but just thinking about that um, you don't have to stay there for a long time. Thinking about your breathing is probably the key, uh, most effective thing uh, for controlling your nervous system. So the, your breath, your breathing is going to be the one controlling uh, how well you would do. And the first time is probably going to be a little bit difficult for you because you will hyperventilate and you cannot really control that the first time. Um, or some people can, and I'm amazed by that, but I couldn't. <laughs> and, and it's going to vary from people to people because some have a very sensitive nervous system and others don't. So it varies and you cannot compare yourself to others. So don't compare yourself to your best friend standing next to you who can go in the water and get, a, a get um, control of their breathing in the first round. And that is not something that you can compare to others. So... But what you can do is try to lower your breathing. Breathe in through the nose and deep uh, into the lungs and try to uh, make it slow and deep and through the nose. And then you step into the cold water. You exhale completely to make room for air because you're going to hyperventilate. If you're very sensitive in your nervous system, it could be that you you are you already know that you're maybe a little bit anxious about the situation or in general an anxious person, then go gently. So you could go halfway in uh, up to the navel or something like that and then try to lower your nervous system by doing nasal bre breathing. And if you feel that that is not for you and you just want to take the whole plunge immediately just two seconds in and then run up, that is also a way to go. Um, I don't think that it's, I, don't, I can't say that as one way is better than the other. I think this is just options. So 
halfway in and then completely in up to the to the neck or completely in in one you can say one second just go in and then quickly up again but yeah if you want to train um your adaptation then in time you should try and see if you can switch from mouth breathing to your nasal breathing which is a kind of a recommendation for your whole life also your everyday but also try to do that in the cold water because that's gonna that's a way to to control your stress level right so yeah so would it be pretty rare for for a first timer to kind of stay long enough in the water to get through the cold shock and find a, a place of of calmness yeah i would say that's a, that could be a, that is rare yeah that is rare okay. especially if you are a person who works inside and you sit at a de- you have a desk job um, so we know that people who work outside um it could be um who work in in the road so builders so they have a better c- cold ad- adaptation than people sitting inside a room temperature or temperature neutrality you can say um so it really depends on how well adapted to the cold you are before that so that's why i'm also saying don't compare because some people also have more muscle mass than other people different body compositions is also going to have an effect how well is your circulation at your blood blood vessels that contracting and dilating so it's all it's all about feeling how do you feel when you go into the cold water and listen to your body that is my most important uh, message to get out there you should listen to your own body and not overdo anything and this is not a competition the cold water has never been a competition it's not a training center for competition it's a, it's a place where you go and you connect with yourself you connect with nature and you also Uh, increase your own metabolism you get healthier but it has nothing to do with comparison this is a self thing selfish thing to do <laughs> it's it's a thing you do for yourself together with others perhaps to kind of preface all of that and to explore some of your research and learnings with working with people and and also um sort of fine tuning your own performance perhaps we we take a step back and look at some of the basic biology so i think there's that fact that gets thrown around um, quite a bit that 60% of the human body by weight is water i think it's a little bit less for females you can um, help us clarify that which works out to be about 40 liters of water and my understanding is that that kind of two thirds of that is within our cells and the rest is in plasma um, circulating through the blood or sort of between cells the interstitial fluid um so when we when we're talking about being hydrated is it is this what we're thinking about these kind of three main components or are we talking about the water in circulation or in cells like what is the, what what is the most important sort of aspect of hydration when we're looking at hydration and the measurements that we have like osmolality urine specific gravity that's all more of a measure of the plasma volume how much water you have in the blood um because when the plasma volume starts to shrink through sweating or through illness sickness that kind of stuff water from the other parts of those compartments start to come into the plasma space because we need to keep the the cells and everything that's in the blood more viscous in order to actually be able to circulate blood. Um so that's why when we talk about hydration and losing x percent of body water or total body mass uh during exercise can have some kind of performance decrement. Um and that all has to do with how much water is available for thermoregulation. When we look at it from an illness point of view, if you have been vomiting or you've had diarrhea, then it's not quite the same I guess aspect of dehydration because you're losing water from other spaces because it's not just pure sweat. But again, if you were to measure it, it would still come from what is going on in the plasma. So it's a it's a nuance that people don't really kind of get. So they're like, "Oh, we can use an oral rehydration solution both in illness and in sweat." um capacity but they're not designed 
for the same thing because the dehydration aspects are a little bit different. So we can look at the amount of water in plasma or in our, sorry, the the volume in our blood. Mm -hmm. And we can use that as a bit of a proxy to understand how well hydrated our cells are. Am I hearing that correctly? Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And where do where do electrolytes come into this? So, um, is I know it's not as simple as just drinking enough water, for example, and you're going to get adequate hydration, particularly if someone is sweating um, a lot or in sort of humid conditions. So, um, can you maybe speak to the role of electrolytes? And and I kind of think back to my early years in university, learning about sort of water homeostasis and concentration gradients. What do we need to understand here at a high level to to then be able to to kind of speak to the use of electrolytes within a hydration strategy? We have to understand the pressure that occurs in the small intestines. So if we look at the upper part of the small intestines, it's very sensitive to pressure changes. So if we look at what the optimal pressure is, it's around 200 milliosmoles. Um, and this is, you'll hear milliosmoles or millimole per liter, that kind of stuff, because it's all about a pressure gradient. So if you're drinking something that's too concentrated in um, carbohydrate, for example, so like typical sports drinks, and it comes in, it raises the pressure in the small intestines. You can't really absorb anything. So why people start to get sloshy gut and feel very gaseous and, and uncomfortable because water has to come from other parts of the body to dilute that carbohydrate, dilute that pressure to bring it down to that optimal pressure in order for things to be absorbed. Now, the flip side of that is if you're just drinking plain water, you don't have enough um, of, of stuff in there to exert a pressure. So then this is where the body's like, Hey, we need to add sodium. We need to add some glucose in order to activate those fluid absorption gates. If you're looking at drinking water with a high concentration of sodium, which often, you know, we see this being pushed by more and more sodium, the more extreme exercise you do, you need sodium, 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 then it can also cause issues because then you have too much sodium. And so the body has to dilute that again before things can be absorbed. So when we talk about electrolyte and electrolyte replacement, this is another misnomer that we find in marketing versus science. Because a lot of times people talk about, oh, you need sodium. Yes, you need sodium, just a little bit of sodium to to activate all of our transport mechanisms when we're at rest. When we're exercising, we need sodium and a little bit of glucose because we've had blood flow diversion away from the gut. So we really want to work with the physiology under this hypoxic, under this hot environment. So we want to have enough stuff in the fluid that we're drinking, not to tip the pressure over, not to be too low, but to actually be adequate to activate all of those fluid transport mechanisms in the sm- small intestines, which is primarily sodium and glucose. So if you have uh, about a one to 3% solution, so that's one to three grams per hundred mil, that's optimal. That's optimal hydration for um, you want the lower end for just kind of like daily hydration. If you're in a hot environment and you're not used to it, it's at the end of the day and you're trying to get on top of your hydration. You want that around 3% when you're exercising. That's a 1% to 3% sodium solution. Carbohydrate solution. And I'll get to the sodium part. Now with sodium, we look at um, minimum really is around... Uh, 40 millimole per liter. So if we look at that as grams, we're saying, yeah, okay, around 100 to 120 milligrams of sodium per liter is adequate. When we start getting above 360 grams or milligrams per liter, we start getting in that too high of sodium state. So we'll see products out there on the market. It's like four or 500 milligrams per liter. And it's, and this is where that whole idea of, oh, we need to replace sodium. Like when we're sweating, well, I'm a salty sweater. I need to replace sodium, but you don't because we can afford to lose up to 50% of our sodium stores and not be affected because we're just looking at how the body is transporting water from one space to another. Yes, it uses sodium, but it's not sodium deplete. You want to have a little bit of sodium in the stuff that you're drinking, but you don't have to go to the extremes. You don't have to take salt tablets. You don't have to take electrolyte tablets. So you're not trying to replace. 
we're trying to work with that small intestines to maximize fluid absorption. So I actually have a, an electrolyte um, product in front of me, and it's not not a sponsored one, so I won't even read out the name of it. But it contains 276 milligrams of sodium per 200 mil. So that's Ooh. over a gram, over one gram of sodium. Yeah, you don't per, need that much. Per liter. Right. At what point do you start getting really interested in food and how it's affecting the environment? So I know that you recently did a TED, you did a TED talk. TEDx talk, yeah. At dedicated mm-hmm. to um, how agriculture is affecting the environment, particularly land use. Yeah, which was land a, and water. And, and I think that concept is critical for people to understand and, yeah. and make sense of. But <clears throat> is that a more recent thing for you that yeah. you've kind of dived into or back when you were working as an earth scientist, were you, were you researching that? You know, back in the earth scientist days, we were focused on greenhouse gases. And so um, cattle produce methane uh, and it's quite potent, but it eventually, you know, it's, it doesn't last as long as carbon dioxide. Um and there's, you know, nitrous oxide from the ammonia in, in their poop and so on. Um, but we were just focused on the gases. And there are still some earth scientists who are very prominent, like Michael Mann, who's sort of written some really good earth science books. And he's a vegan, but or he doesn't eat beef. Um, and But he's fo- totally focused on the gases. Once you start focusing on agriculture it becomes a different story. And I'd had some agricultural background in my earth science days from water testing, but I didn't, I never connected the dots back then. And it wasn't until uh, Joseph Poor at Oxford and Hannah Ritchie, um, who you've had on your show, that was a great episode, um, started talking about the impact of beef that I started looking at it more carefully. and. Oh my gosh, it's it's mind blowing. It's just shocking. Right, those some of those those graphs that our world and data have put together yeah. through Hannah Ritchie's work and Joseph Paul's research yeah. are, um, I think, some of the the best visuals on this. Topic. Unbelievable. I simplified the graph a little bit for my TEDx talk, but I, but it was right out of Joseph Poor's data, and for listeners who are listening to it on a podcast. Four billion hectares is what the footprint of agriculture is today. And I know nobody can envision that. But if you just remove beef, it goes to two billion hectares. That's half, half of the land use if you just remove beef. And if you remove dairy, it's one billion hectares. So it's half again. So it's, and people think that a vegetarian diet is earth friendly, but it includes dairy if it's lacto ovo. Uh, and so a vegetarian diet that does not include uh, fish, pigs, and chickens has twice the land footprint of one that doesn't include dairy, but does include pigs, chickens, and fish. Very counterintuitive, but that's the data that Joseph Poor produced and Hannah Ritchie, you know, has produced the beautiful graphs on. And then on top of that, for the land use problem, the the footprint for land use of beef is, uh, is 10 times or more what it is for chickens or pigs, monogastric animals. And they're almost 10 times what it is for plants. So it's a hundred times more than like soybeans and nuts and and all that stuff. And the water use issue is not much better. The 17 uh, states that comprise the Southwest that have the water crisis that where the Colorado River no longer flows into the ocean and we have to get rid of our lawns and all that kind of stuff, 6%. Only 6% of the water footprint of those 17 states is for residential use, showers and swimming pools and all that kind of stuff. 8% is for commercial use, commercial buildings with fountains out front, motels and all that stuff. And the rest, 83%, comes from irrigated agriculture. And of course, we're going to have to eat and irrigated agriculture is important, but not to the extent that 38% of the total water footprint is just for growing crops to feed cows, mainly alfalfa. And it's just shocking. Um, So, you know, my wife is very environmentally responsible. So we catch the shower water in a bucket and we pour it on our plants and things like that. (laughs) 
you know how much that influences the problem. It's like lost in the round off error. Whereas eating burgers on the corner, that's huge. So it, very counterintuitive, but the data is standing up. So when Joseph Poor first published that data, I, I, my jaw went to the floor. I almost dislocated my jaw, but it seems to be holding up. How much of this do you think is personal responsibility versus like if we're thinking about mainstream adoption of a shift in diet towards a diet that is using or is allows us to free up a lot of land and maybe we can speak to why that's important but free up a lot of land use a lot less water how much of that do you think is is going to come down to individuals taking action themselves versus governments changing the food system it's a very good question to to accurately describe the problem 95 percent of deforestation today is in our rainforests all over the world and the big one that we're all worried about is the Amazon. Um, the deforestation just over the last 20 years, just 20 years, is equivalent to the land area of the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, Poland, Germany, and one other of those European countries combined over 20 years. You see that on a map and you just, oh. And 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon is coming from uh, the raising cattle, leather for our car seats and also to eat burgers. And the other 20% is mainly coming from soy to feed pigs in Asia because pork is quite popular in Asia. Sorry about bumping the microphone. Uh, so um, that's all, you know, just like super shocking. And I don't think people understand, not even nutritionists understand how damaging beef is to your health. For example, I did this episode on hyperpalatability with Tara Fazzino. She's a psychologist at the University of Kansas who runs the addiction center there. And there's this controversy around whether food can be addictive. Can, can something you have to eat three times a day, can you really classify that as addictive? But her observation is, well, the behavior that people are exhibiting when they eat certain foods is addictive behavior. So, um, so she started looking at, she and, um, and Kevin Hall decided, you know what, the food companies are way ahead of us. They've figured this out. We're just trying to catch up with all the things that they're doing. The artificial flavors, billion dollar, many, multi-billion dollar companies just to come up with the chemical flavoring for Doritos. So three different cheese tones release on your tongue at different times, you know, and so on. And so she had this, this chart on the rise of hyperpalatability of foods. <laughs> It's so shocking. Just look at the rise of obesity from 1980 to today, and you can see why that is. And we associate that with ultra-processed foods. So Doritos, uh, Twinkies, and all that. Um, but in her research, she turned up the fact that it doesn't have to be, as Michael Moss suggested in his famous book, Fat, Sugar, Salt. It only has to be fat and salt, and it can be very hyperpalatable. All you have to have is whatever it is, 30% of calories coming from fat and a certain weight as a percentage of the food coming from sodium. And it can have no carbs and be hyper palatable. And it's like, ding, 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 what's going on here? Um, so I started looking um, uh, you know, at beef, for example. And I asked Tara and I asked Michael Moss, I called him up and asked, this trend towards marbling of beef, is, is that making it hyperpalatable? Is it getting above 30% fat and then you salt it and it becomes hyperpalatable? And they didn't know. And Tara said, well, the research hasn't gotten there. So I started looking at what the cattlemen are saying about marbling beef. They get a higher price for choice cuts and, and whatever the highest cuts of beef are, um, choice and prime. And, um, and in order to get there, they have to get induced like Angus, the Angus breed of beef to get marbled fat in their muscles. And the way they do that, uh, they've been doing it by feeding them grain, which isn't their native diet. Uh, but the way they're doing it now is by uh, artificial intelligence driven breeding. And so they're getting the, the beef to be 65% fat. And that fat does not have a good profile. It's saturated fat. 
and it's only 35% protein. So um, you see people go to McDonald's and they get, <laughs> because they're low carbers, and they just get the, you know, Dr. Barry uh, just gets the hamburger patties from McDonald's. And I looked it up, it's 64% fat for those hamburger patties and enough salt to make them hyper palatable. So you think, oh, it's the, you know, the bun and the sauces and, but the beef is a whole food, right? It's a whole food. Well, no, they've turned it into a, in my view, a hyper processed, hyper palatable food before slaughter through very clever breeding. And so we have never, not in Herman Ponser's books or anywhere else in human history, we have never been exposed to a food like beef that has that level of saturated fat in it, no fiber, and people are thinking it's a high protein food, but it's it's not a high protein food. Tofu is higher protein. Fish is higher is high protein, you know, unless it's a really fatty fish. We've gone through number one, the storage of carbon being additional, verifiable, and attributable. So the, the science that's being presented, you're saying, falls down here. It also can fall down when we look at number two, so carbon storage, the sort of offsetting or counteracting um, effect. Number three, carbon opportunity cost. What what do we see here when we look at, at studies that people within holistic grazing would cite What's not being considered when it comes to carbon opportunity cost? The key issue here is land use. And and it's the issue which people are really seem to struggle to get their heads around. And while as environmentalists, we're very good about talking about greenhouse gases, um, talking about pollutants, um, talking about water use, we're really, really bad at talking about land use. And yet land use should be right up there as one of our top environmental metrics. How much land are we using? Because every hectare of land you use for an extractive industry is a hectare of land which can't be used for other purposes. You're shutting off possibilities by using land for one thing rather than another. And, and that's inevitable. You know, with any land use, you're going to be shutting off possibilities. But what that means is that if you're trying to protect wild habitats, intact habitats, we should be using as little land as we possibly can. And by far and away, the greatest danger to habitats worldwide is agricultural sprawl. Now, you know, the only time we really consider land use is when we're talking about urban sprawl. An urban sprawl is is a real problem. You know, you only need to go to Adelaide to see that. Um, uh, these very spread out cities um, swallow up a lot of land. Um, they're also much harder to service with public transport, with um, with with water mains and the rest of it. And so, um, you you've got much bigger infrastructure costs as well if you've got a sprawling city. I think uh, urban sprawl is bad for cities as well as being bad for the countryside. But the entire urban area of the planet, all the homes, all the businesses, all the infrastructure occupies 1% of the terrestrial surface of the planet. It should be less. You know, we should be able to do it in three quarters of 1%, but it's 1%, right? Agriculture occupies 38% of the surface of the planet. And, and much of the rest of that planet is um, desert, it's ice cap, it's rocky mountain tops, which you couldn't use for agriculture anyway. Only 15% of the planet is protected area of the terrestrial surface, uh, far too little. Agriculture, 38%. And so let's break that down. Um, arable crops, so crops planted in the ground, is 12% of the surface of the planet. And of that, only six or seven percent, uh, slightly more than half, is used to produce crops directly for human consumption. So five or six percent of the surface of the planet is growing crops to feed to animals, which humans then eat. Um, and, and so it's a very, very small amount growing crops for us. So hang on, what about that remaining 26% um, of, of the planet? What's that? All of that is grazing land. All that is producing cattle and sheep through 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 grazing on grasslands, on on savannas, on pasture, on the rest. 
And that grazing land produces a very tiny fraction of our food. It, it's hard to tell exactly how much because so many animals are taken off the grazing land and finished in feedlots towards the end of their lives to fatten them up quickly because they grow slowly on, on grazing land. But the, the animals, and this doesn't capture the whole of it, but the animals um, who, who are grown entirely on grazing land produce just 1% of the world's protein across 26% of the land area. Um, and you know we're talking we're looking at the vast majority of the agricultural land area is is used for that grazing. This is a fantastically wasteful land use. This is an extremely profligate way of using the world's most precious resource, which is land. And every hectare that that occupies is a hectare which could otherwise have been occupied by a wild ecosystem, by a rainforest, by a savanna, by a natural grassland. And the great majority of the world's species depend on wild ecosystems for their survival. In fact, earth systems themselves depend on wild ecosystems for their survival. So the worst thing you can possibly do is to take away wild ecosystems on an industrial scale. Now, there was a very interesting paper published a couple of years ago, which said, what would happen if we did what all the Alan Savories of this world and the celebrity chefs and the food writers and all those other influences told us to do, which is to stop eating feedlot beef and switch to pasture fed, grass fed beef instead. You know, and this has become this great foodie thing. You should all be eating grass fed beef. And now we can all agree we hate feedlot beef, right? It's, it's horrible. It's disgusting. It's appalling. But the only thing worse than feedlot beef is grass fed beef. And the reason for that is the vast amount of agricultural sprawl it causes. And what this paper found was that if you switched away from feedlot beef to pasture-fed beef, in the United States, the area devoted to keeping cattle would need to rise by 270%. You would need to cut down all the forests. You'd need to drain all the wetlands. You'd need to water all the deserts. You'd need to degazette all the national parks. You need to demolish all the cities, and you would still be importing a lot of your beef from Brazil. It, 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 there just is not enough planet for us to be eating grass-fed beef or, or sheep. There's just not enough room for that. It's 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 a luxury product, but because lots of people are eating it, that luxury product has caused environmental destruction across massive tracks of of the planet and now if we had lots of planets and no space for wild ecosystems on any of them yeah sure we could all eat grass-fed beef and lamb but we don't we, we 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 have this one planet and we have to look after it and the best way of looking after it is to minimize our land footprint and what grass-fed um, beef and lamb production does is to maximize our land footprint Let's just double click a little bit more on building this relationship with yourself and establishing or um, cultivating more self-love so that you can you can be more autonomous in the way that you're living your life. From a, a daily practice point of view, are there things that you would encourage people to think about doing or like to think about the way they're speaking to themselves, the narrative in their head. That's a big one. So start with the lowest hanging fruit. How do you talk to yourself? Because most people, and I really do mean most, talk to themselves horrendously. I remember when I first started the practice of bringing awareness to myself, my inner dialogue. There were times where I was like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm saying this to myself. Mm. Just beat yourself up. Yeah. And it's and sometimes it's so like it's so sly. It's like it's like, oh, Julian, don't be so stupid. Like just little things like that. But imagine hearing that from a friend or a parent or a lover. Stop being so stupid. That would be considered abuse. That's an interesting way to frame it. To take that sentence or phrase and and experience it as if it was coming from someone else. Yeah. And we would and people would cry abuse over that. So why are we abusing ourselves? So it starts with that level of awareness and you just it's 
once you become aware of that and you start to notice it, then you're, then you just interrupt it and be like, no, no, I'm not going to talk to myself that way. And you just talk to yourself differently. So that's, it's really important. Start, there's nowhere, there's no other place to start, but there, I think. And then, you know, self-love could also be cleaning up your room. Self-love could be taking one task that you've been procrastinating on forever and just freaking doing it. Self-love is putting yourself out there and building some community. How important is that piece to the relationship that you have with yourself, the people that you're surrounding yourself with, and, and, and how they speak to themselves and treat one another? I think it's huge. I believe that we are who we spend the most amount of time with. And that's why I tell people who are dating, why would you ever, like you, ha before you really decide if someone is someone that you're going to really pursue like a, a real relationship with, you better know, you better meet their friends because if they suck, that says something about them. <laughs> and in order to determine if they suck, I mean, there's obvious things, but right. is that coming back to the your values, your interests? No. So yes. Yeah, so there's two things. So if they're if they're not nice people, right? If they're so that's that's important, right? It it actually it seems so obvious. However, it's so tragically overlooked. Like. It's, it's important that the person, it's important that we have nice people in our mm. lives. So you're looking for sort of acts of kindness or the way that people are talking about others. And how they are with each other. Do they have good, are they, do they have each other's backs? Is there a loyalty right, there? some camaraderie. Yeah, camaraderie, loyalty. Yeah, I think that's very big because... Loyalty is a very important and necessary component of relationship. What about practices like journaling and gratitude? Are you, are you big on those? Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I never kept a journal as a child. And so I've always been resistant to it. But I, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's this book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And it's changed millions of people's lives. And I know why. It actually is, there's something profound. I don't think, and some people won't find it, but there's something profound about within the first 15 minutes of waking, just writing everything down for three pages. Not coherent senses, just getting everything out. Everyone has a creative inside of them, and most people are walking around with untapped creativity inside of them, and that's making them really sad. How important is being in a romantic partnership? And how, how much does it impact our overall well-being, do you think? I read a recent statistic that I thought was interesting. I think it's six out of ten young men in the United States are selectively single. Yeah. And less than half of them are looking for a relationship. And I saw a psychologist comment on it, and he was suggesting they're having their needs met elsewhere from social media and porn, yeah. for, for example. Right. So... How important is it that our needs are met from someone else versus social media, porn, etc., things that we can do by ourselves? So this is a question that I debate in my head and with my mentor all the time. Um, I definitely believe wholeheartedly that our greatest spiritual growth happens inside of a romantic relationship. And to learn how to transcend our egos and to really love someone um, is, is profound. And the person who's always avoiding that will be um, stunted in some way emotionally. But I also know that there's plenty of people and like women, for example, after they reach a certain age, you know, maybe it's like around 60 and they really, they really are living their best lives. And they said, you know, I did i did the marriage i did this and this is really okay for me so i think that a healthy relationship one filled with love and respect and loyalty is very good for our health 
physical health. But a bad relationship will destroy it. Yeah, when I think about the fact that so many young men are not even pursuing relationships <clears throat> and where they're getting their needs met, whether it's social media or porn, which is a big discussion in and of itself, it kind of it reminds me of nutrition in some ways and this um, kind of s the seductive nature of ultra processed foods mm -hmm. and we get a whole lot of instant gratification they feel amazing yeah. but in four or five decades from now we're going to be riddled with chronic disease and feel pretty lousy and, and I think about those young men and in 30 50 years from now are we going to see a lot more loneliness I think that that I think that loneliness. I think I read a, a study recently that loneliness is really the thing that most men are facing today. A lot of isolation. Um, I'd have to find the source, but there was an article recently, and I wish I could recall about how men, you know, aren't really they don't have like community, they don't have friendships. I think isolation is one of the worst things for a person's soul, honestly, and. Um, I find that statistic sad, very sad. I think that um, there is just so much benefit to doing life with someone. Yeah, there's a lot of happiness that's potentially being left on the table. Yeah. That's part of the human experience or yes. can be. But it's also good to know how to be alone. Mm -hmm. Solitude. Because is that an important part of building that relationship with yourself? I think so. I think that if you're someone who's always like swung from like vine to vine like a monkey from you know from from relationship serial to relation monogamy yes yeah, serial monogamy <laughs> relationship to relationship it really would benefit a person to know how to be alone look if you're afraid to be alone your chances of choosing the wrong partner the wrong person to partner just triples that's good insight yeah so I think that it's always a really good thing to enjoy your own company. So in your, your book, Unwinding Anxiety, you put forward a solution to anxiety and, and these destructive habits that can be downstream of anxiety uh, is to rewire the survival or old brain um, not the, the kind of rational or, or new brain. Can you explain the difference between the old and the new brain if someone's hearing that for the first time? Yeah, and this is, I, I want to highlight that this is a, a heuristic. It's a, it's a useful explanatory model. It's not really how the brain is set up. So often we'll hear about the lizard brain or this or that. The brain's not really set up with layers like this. Certainly there's a cortical layer on top of these you know more basic structures like the basal ganglia yet they're very intricately <laughs> connected with each other. But the heuristic is really helpful. And the way that works is, you know, these, these, these very important survival mechanisms are going to win out over, over other mechanisms that aren't as critical. And, and we can even think of them as the ones that evolved later in, you know, in time, like planning, I, or, you know, this heuristic is that they, they're kind of a newer and the younger part of the brain. So for example, the prefrontal cortex is a younger part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective. And it's involved in planning and cognitive control, you know, willpower, things like that. And so ironically, it's the first part of the brain that goes offline when we get stressed or anxious. You know, there's this term, uh, I've probably heard it, hangry, you know, when we're, we're hungry, we get angry, we have trouble with self-control or in addiction treatment we learn this uh, acronym halt when we're hungry angry lonely or tired that's when we're vulnerable to relapse because that's when our you know our thinking our willpower our cognitive control parts of the brains are least functional and so from a very pragmatic perspective you know i don't know if this started with the age of enlightenment or whatnot you know i think therefore i am we've been really focusing on thinking our ways out of problems. Yet, we're, this, is, you know, this was the dominant paradigm before neuroscience was even a field of study. And if you take a neuroscience approach, the neuroscience would say, 
you know, willpower at best is, you know, it's more myth than muscle. And so we said, well, you know, if, if you can't rely on this part of the brain, let's look at these older parts of the brain that are really strong, you know, and they're going to dominate when, you know, when we're, you know, when our prefrontal cortex goes offline, let's leverage the power of that part of the brain. And that's where, that's the habit part of the brain. It's kind of, you know, we, we default to our habits when we're on autopilot, but also when that thinking part of the brain goes offline. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it, it gets me thinking about uh, something that Dan Buettner, I'm not sure if you know him, you've, you've probably come across his work with the blue zones, but I've heard, something I've that heard, he often, Oh, yes, that's what I was going to say, blue zones, yeah. It's something that he often says is the difference between uh, centenarians in the blue zones and people in, in developed countries who are experiencing poor health and have a, a, a shorter health span and are living shorter lives is is not willpower. It's not that the centenarians, you know, have you know this greater degree of willpower. It's that. You know, he puts it down to the the fact that they just live in in an environment that is conducive to to better habits. Um, but there's some overlap there, I guess, with regards to you know, willpower or willing our way to better habits. Perhaps not being the the best strategy. Maybe we can come back to an environment if if and and when we get the opportunity to talk about food, because I, I know you have some things to to say on that. Uh, so this idea of of <clears throat> focusing on the kind of quote unquote old brain or where we default to when we're under stress is this what you mean when you say in order to develop new habits we have to change the way we think about our habits yes and i would say pra- absolutely and from a pragmatic standpoint we have to change the way we feel about habits. And what I mean by that is the feeling body is much stronger than the thinking brain. And to just double click on that, when you look at habit formation, it's driven by how something feels, right? Is something rewarding or not? It's not about, well, I think this is good or bad for me, right? If if we could just use our thinking brain, then none of my patients would smoke because they all know that smoking is bad for them. But their feeling body says, well, I'm going into withdrawal. This doesn't feel good. Okay, so I know I shouldn't smoke, but I'm going to because it scratches that itch of withdrawal. So that feeling body is so powerful. And so, you know, we really focus on that as like, okay, let's change the way we feel about habits and what i mean by that is we bring awareness in so that we can really feel into what the results of these behaviors are so as we mentioned earlier this process is called reward-based learning for a reason if something's rewarding we're going to keep doing it if it's not rewarding we're going to stop so from a neuroscience standpoint there's this critical element that drives what's called an error term that changes behavior. And that critical element is awareness. If you pay attention and something is rewarding, you're going to keep doing it. If you pay attention and it's not rewarding, you're going to stop. And then as you pay attention, you see how rewarding something is, it becomes a habit. Uh, Let's use an everyday example. Let's say a new bakery opens up in my neighborhood and I go in there, I like chocolate cake. So I have a certain expectation for what good chocolate cake tastes like. And so if I go in there and I eat their chocolate cake, it's like the most delicious chocolate cake I've ever had. (laughs) I get what's called a positive prediction error, which means it's better than expected. Dopamine fires in my brain. I learn good bakery, go back there. On the other hand, if I eat the cake, I'm like, meh, I've had better. My brain gets a negative prediction error and it says, don't bother. Also, dopamine firing, I learn, don't go back to the bakery. So I've learned in both scenarios. We're trying to, to break these associations that we have, these kind of uh, reflexive 
behaviors that we have to a particular trigger with attention, drawing attention to them and reassigning the the value or the reward that we get from them. Yeah, and the good news is we don't have to actively reassign anything. Our brain will do it for us as long as we pay attention, as long as we're aware of what's happening. So for example, if we're really aware of what a cigarette tastes and smells like, you know, I, I, that's what I have my patients do. I say, go smoke. And they look at me like, my doc just told me to smoke, but I say, no, pay attention when you smoke. And they go out and smoke and they realize the cigarettes taste like crap. And so there, that gets reassigned in their brain because they're now paying attention. They never tasted good. They just kind of ignore that because they're more focused on getting that dopamine hit and getting, you know, relieving that withdrawal but they can't once they pay attention they can't ignore that and they can do the same thing with worrying you know say well pay attention to the results of worrying and what what do you get well i feel more anxious oh i didn't notice that before oh and they start to become disenchanted with the worrying because they realize it's not solving their problems it's not keeping them safe and in fact it's feeding back and making them more anxious so is there a tipping point that that needs to be reached in order to to break that habit i'm just thinking here about the example of let's say the 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 person who's smoking that they would have to be so disgusted by the the smell and the the taste that it was outweighing that immediate relief that they are getting that they can feel yeah absolutely you you've hit the nail on the head which is if if the reward value is net positive they're going to keep doing it. If it's net negative, they start to become disenchanted. If it's really negative, it that disenchantment builds even faster. Uh, and, and as a, an example, my lab did a study with our, we have this app called Eat Right Now that helps people pay attention as they eat. It helps people with emotional eating, overeating, et cetera. And we looked to see how quickly that reward value dropped below zero. Ready for this? It only takes... 10 to 15 times on average for somebody to really pay attention to whatever eating feels like for that reward value to be net negative and for them to change their behavior. Now, we all know this from our own experience. <laughs> Nobody ever says, oh, it feels so good when I overeat. You know, they're like, oh, bloated. Oh, my stomach's exploding. Oh, I feel lethargic. All this negative stuff that we kind of ignore or watch television so that we are, we're distracted from it. But when people really pay attention, they can gather that information pretty quickly. So when someone's eating that cake they're try- and they're trying to break that habit, it's a little different to the cigarette. It, the taste is amazing, but what you're saying is in terms of paying attention In this instance, they're paying attention to the more immediate things that they they can feel, how their digestion is, whether they have energy afterwards, as opposed to thinking about the long-term consequences of eating those foods. Um, Because I know we're we're pretty poor, I guess, at uh, delayed gratification, practicing delayed gratification versus you know immediate gratification and um acting on on impulse because that slice of cake tastes amazing yes yeah and that's an evolutionary function that says i don't know if i'm gonna be alive in 10 years so rather eat the cake now or smoke the cigarette now as compared to well maybe i'll gain weight or maybe i'll get cancer so yes very serious serious delay discounting curve meaning that you know we're going to favor those immediate rewards over future ones and it's hard for us to imagine into the future, but it's pretty easy for us to imagine what that first taste of cake is going to feel like. So let, let's use a real world example. We run a live group every week for people using our digital therapeutics. And somebody came to the group and said, you know, I was going to a party with my husband and my friend makes this, you know, world renowned cake. You know, she's like, everybody talks about this cake, you know, because it's so good. She's like, I was going to this party fully expecting to eat three pieces of this cake because that's what I've always done. So she was using our Eat Right Now program and learning to pay attention as she ate. And so she ate, literally, she she was so incredulous. She's like, 
I ate half a piece of this cake and it was still delicious, but then I didn't want any more. And I turned to my husband and said, does the cake not taste as good? And he's like, no, it tastes just as good as it always does. But she's realizing she didn't need to eat more to really enjoy it. And in fact, when she ate more, she enjoyed it less because her body was saying, dude, that's too much. I think of it as this, this pleasure plateau, you know? And so it's like, how much is enough? You eat, you know, it tastes good, tastes good, tastes good. And then it stops, you know, our body's like, okay, whoa, put on the brakes. And then we hit this plateau where it's no longer rewarding. And then if we don't pay attention, we're going to go over this cliff of overindulgence, <laughs> you know, and we're off the cliff and then we crash and, and think, boy, that was, that was three pieces. My, I feel terrible now. For someone to kind of navigate this in their own life, and you mentioned habit loops before, but what we're talking about here is identifying what's triggering you to take certain action, whatever the behavior is that uh, perhaps you're trying to get rid of or reduce, and then using attention to really hone in on how you actually feel after that behavior. So getting very, very, I guess, purposeful, honest with what that experience is and in doing so, reassigning the value that is attached to that action. Yeah, and I would say, so when it's habitual, we're not paying attention to how rewarding it is. We're just acting it out on autopilot. So... I would, I would say the reassignment, I would say we can think of it as re-assigning, meaning we're seeing clearly how rewarding it actually is right now. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So I just want to be clear about that because often people try to think themselves into changing behavior like, this should be bad for me, or I shouldn't like cake, or I shouldn't eat cake. Well, cake tastes good ice cream tastes good, chocolate tastes good. You know, that's always, it, it, for people that like chocolate, ice cream, cake, it's always going to taste good. And if they pay attention, they're going to realize how delicious it actually is. So the reassignment comes when we see what the results are, for example, when we eat too much or when we smoke a cigarette and realize that, oh, I never really paid attention. You know, I started smoking when I was a teenager and I never really paid attention to how bad it actually tastes and smells. Well, now they can't not see that because that that's right in their face when they're paying attention. That's the critical aspect. I think of it as developing disenchantment with the behavior. And that disenchantment comes exclusively from awareness. If they're not paying attention, they're just going to keep doing it. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.